fibrotic patches that have been, that have been met, then uh, the device can be used very safely by using only uh, the tip or the convex part of the device uh, and, and used in different directions in a multi-directional way, uh, uh, similar to some surgical tools. Uh, as you can see here, the device can be turned one-to-one -one rotation uh, uh, by following the bowel counter and the mass layer uh, without damaging any, 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 any muscle bed. Again, a pre-coagulation, or you can see clearly after two or three seconds, there's a um, degradation of the, of the collagen and, and that causes a very efficient and uh, obliteration of the vessels. Again, well, the, the device can be used in different directions uh, from six to 12 to three to nine. Uh, uh, this is uh, on the last uh, part of the of, of the lesion. Uh, that was really a very interesting lesion because it was about 6.8 uh, centimeters in the mid rectum. Uh, unfortunately, retroflexion was not possible. Uh, so we managed to um, excise this lesion and block in, in 55 minutes, which is it's a similar time that, that, that now we use the tunneling te technique and also the aid of this advanced platform uh, that can predict the time of a, a endoscopic uh, submicolor dissection or to be correct, a speedboat dissection. Uh, but of course, we have to look at the location, morphology, and fibrosis elements. But you can see uh, the muscle bed following the, the resection is quite clean. Uh, there's no carbonization. The muscle uh, uh, bundles are, are, are preserved uh, without any, any damage because of the whole design of the device. Uh, this, is, uh, th this is a resection that uh, took, in, took us about 55 minutes, patient went home the same day, uh, and there, was no, uh, there were no complications. Uh, try now to compare uh, the two um, uh, EMR and ESD and SSD, and I think uh, we're looking forward to see you to have more details about in our CAN course uh, in September, uh, to October 2021. Uh, many thanks for your time and, and uh, accommodation. on behalf of Creo Medical and they, they uh, invented this uh, brilliant device together and Zach is at the East Kent University Hospital in Margate. So Zach, thank you very much uh, for showing this to us and uh, I think we'll hear more of this in the, in the near future. Okay, our travel goes on. We now go to Brussels. Brussels is the capital, as everybody knows, of the EU. Maybe also the capital of good foot, although I think there's a great competition, Milano and Rome and Paris and others will protest. Um, and uh, as a moderator, we have a guy in Milano, but he's actually from Orlando, and that's uh, Shyam Varadarajulu. He came all the way. Welcome, Shyam. So please uh, moderate the Brussels sessions and uh, the next one as well. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for having me there. There is only one conflict. I think the best food is in Orlando, Florida, uh, than, in, than in Rome or Brussels. So we'll go to Brussels with uh, Jacques Debier and Mariana, uh, and they're going to demonstrate for us this afternoon a yeah, good case of spiral endoscopy. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello, uh, Shyam. We will continue the discussion about the food in Orlando <laughs> later on, but today... <laughs> I have the pleasure of welcoming you in Brussels. Uh, we have here uh, Michel Bourin, who is our anesthesiologist, Leila and Francine, who are our nurse, and I will be pleased to assist uh, Mariana, who is leading the program of Midgut Enteroscopy in our center. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so uh, the case here, uh, I don't see if you see the... Uh, the date of this, of the, the reason why we're doing this procedure. So this 72-year-old male, he has... Um, the, the, the patient has a Lynch syndrome. Uh, uh, yes, though you have the, yeah. uh, the clinical mm. history. He has a Lynch syndrome. He has been operated twice for a cancer of the colon and a rectal cancer. And he has been admitted uh, again for uh, anemia. And the capsule endoscopy was performed uh, because the upper and lower were negative. And you see that uh, uh, approximately 45 minutes after the pylorus, uh, this uh, lesion was observed at the capsule uh, endoscopy. And the capsule stayed in place for 
uh, almost uh, 20 or 30 minutes there. So suggesting that not only there is a lesion which is obvious, but also some narrowing. Uh, the, the purpose of this study is of course to have a biopsy to make a differential diagnosis between a carcinoma, which is probable, or a lymphoma, but also to do a marking of the lesion uh, before possible surgery. So uh, uh, we have already done an apogee endoscopy. Uh, we still dilate with a 20 uh, millimeter bougie before doing the spiral. Uh, our friends from Düsseldorf said that it's not necessary, but there's still no comparative on that, of course. Uh, but it still gives us a general feeling about how the spiral is going to pass and also uh, 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 an overview of the upper GI. So there was no, no particularity. We already dilated. And here is the, the device. So what we do before uh, is uh, checking uh, uh, the, uh, the movements. This is um, uh, backwards. And we see that there is a, uh, um, a security system where if I... Uh, I have too much resistance, the system stops, and it's embedded in our, in our uh, screen, and also the forward. And we see that both uh, directions are moving. And now we will introduce the scope. So when we introduce the scope, it's very important that uh, we put the patient on the, on the left lateral position. We, have, uh, we do it still with anesthesia and uh, endotracheal intubation, but... Uh, uh, in Düsseldorf, again, they have doing, been doing it as well without intubation, so it's uh, possible. And what we will do here, we will insert the tip of the endoscope, like a normal endoscope. And then we'll start putting gel for the introduction, and we'll put a bit of upper extension. And I will ask uh, Michelle to deflate the tube. And then we will. So the purpose of deflating the tube is mainly to limit the resistance against the, the, the tracheal balloon. And now Mariana will apply the, the torque forward. So this is the, the, the an example of the the, the spiral, which uh, the spiral which is fixed on the endoscope. So these are single-use spiral. You see that the the coil is very flexible. The idea is to be as atraumatic as possible while keeping the the force to help the advancement of the tube. And of course, the big difference with any other device is that the 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 force is applied from the tip of the endoscope or from the distal part of the endoscope. So the endoscope will be pulled inside the GI tract. Uh, later on, you will see that the technique consists in playing the, the small bowel over the, over the spiral. And so here we see that we still we always have a vision on the, on the resistances. This is important in the esophagus because when we have resistance, we will stop, we will do some backwards, then go forwards again. And we have a marking at 80 centimeter, which tells us that when we are sure that all the spiral is inside the stomach. So here I ask Michel to reinflate. And here we are in the stomach. And we will do the normal endoscopy until the second, du the pylorus second duodenum by moving the, by applying forward, uh, forward movement on the spiral, or the motor, the motor. There is also a role for uh, generous irrigation. Uh, once we will be into the small bowel in order to increase the liquid content and, uh, and allow us a better uh, advancement. There is also some role of the assistant to jiggle the scope sometimes. And this is why uh, Francine is there 
uh, ready to help if we need some help uh, for advancing uh, the, the endoscope. The, one of the tricky parts of the procedure is to pass the, the trite angle and to pass the proximal duodenum. Here I'm still in the second duodenum, so it can be also a bit tricky. He had an angle here that's, it's true that I had a bit difficulty with the normal scope, so. So Jack, in patients with uh, surgical anatomy, is it particularly fast to advance the uh, endoscope? Uh, the surgical anatomy is, a, is uh, an indication where we have some experience. I think that the group of us is, is more experienced than we have. So we have done uh, a few enteroscopy to do uh, ERCP procedure. We have okay, a small movie if you want uh, to see it later on. Okay. But uh, it's very difficult to have any conclusion for the time being. It's feasible. Uh -huh. uh, we reach, especially in the very difficult anatomy, it seems that we reach more often the duodenum that way with a, a simple, a single balloon uh, device. Uh, but there are no uh, carefully acquired data, published data available yet. Uh, but this could be this could be a, a, new, a good indication. The problem is that when you have a who and why. Uh, anatomy, uh, of course, you have to choose the, the right room, but sometimes you may be stuck at the level of the anastomosis because this part is fixed. And of course, we are always very careful with this patient. We would like to avoid uh, complications. And uh, so I would say that in all ends, the success of reaching the, the second part of the duodenum in Rue Noir anatomy is approximately 60 persons, six out of 10, uh, which is probably not so, so impressive, but we are also uh, We're still learning. rapidly, we are still learning mm -hmm. and we are also rapidly moving to another approach since we do also the percutaneous approach ourselves. So this is something that uh, is still ongoing, but you're right. This this is a possible a possible indication. The two studies which have been the, the two multicentric studies which have been published so far have shown the feasibility, the fact that it works very well. The, the fact also that even in the hands of people who are not really the the the, the highest specialists in enteroscopy. Uh, we can achieve a complete enteroscopy up to the second in a, in a significant percentage of case through the, through the, the enter, enterograde approach. And when we combine both, we can achieve a complete enteroscopy in more than two thirds of the patient. She, she called me, yeah, she called me. She called me. Okay, now you see that Mariana is entering the proximal part of the, yes. of the jejunum. So at this stage, she will mainly aspire and uh, flush around her and continue to apply the pressure with a very modest pressure with the endoscope. Mm -hmm. You see that this can be even straight yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you see that as long as Mariana is keeping the pressure, we can pull back the scope and then we will be in a better position. So it's mostly, I think we have something here. So it's mostly uh, uh, putting water, aspiring, and uh, uh, straighten the scope while doing forward uh, movements. But I think that we... How does, how does putting new? water help with the, with, the, with the propulsion of the scope? I think that putting water mainly helps in avoiding you to inflate too much. Okay. I think that what doesn't help is to inflate CO2 too much during the advancement because it provides some distension of the small bowel and then probably less adhesion of the spire. So when we inflate, we can have a view, uh, an underwater view mm -hmm. also, which will yeah. mainly decrease our, our tendency to insufflate. Just checking here because I thought I saw something, but no. Oh, no. 
Okay. You're and we also do uh, abdominal compressions okay. by the nurse, and this really helps uh, progress the help rate progression, as you see. So I will straighten again my scope by applying forward uh, movement, a bit like in colonoscopy. So when you advance the scope, is it a clockwise torque that you have to apply? To yes, yes, it's the forward, so it's clockwise, yeah. The, 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 the thing that we have to acquire there is that very often we may advance with the endoscope almost in a straight position and then just applying a modest pressure because from from the time you have passed the, the, the trade angle, what we want to have is, a, is just playing the, the small ball over the spiral. And this is easier when you are in a, in a more straight position. So, Jack, how many centimeters can the scope advance in a normal anatomy in a minute? Is it 10 to 20 centimeters? How many, how many centimeters? I, I, didn't, I didn't catch your question. I'm sorry. How many centimeters will this uh, spirus endoscope advance in a minute? Ah, uh, I never calculated. I, I just, uh, <laughs> in I the study, we, we it, said four meters in the study. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it's very usually, subjective. Usually within uh, 30 to 45 minutes, you can advance three, three meters. Mm -hmm, yeah. So Double. this is... Uh, Okay. This is what we, ob we have observed, yes. But it's rough estimates, huh? We, uh... Yeah, I mean, the math tells me it's about 10 to 15 centimeters a minute. Okay. But, uh, there are some anatomies which are more uh, adequate for excess speed, but uh, I never calculated. This is a, this is a tough question. We usually what we do is we ask the one of our nurses uh, to count the folds. And uh, they spend a lot of attention to count the folds. Uh, and then we say nine millimeters per fold, and then we do the estimation, but it's very, very approximate. Okay, you see no better than it's really advancing by itself. Mm -hmm. So you are... Sometimes, sometimes when you see a good progression, we don't see yet a very fast progression, but sometimes with a good progression, you can even keep the endoscope in forward move when you don't have too much, uh, uh, too much resistance, and then it will pass the, the angle by itself. We still don't have the scope in the United States. So do you have the problems of the scope falling back and are there fixed to find open position? I didn't. Uh, falling back, but with yeah. the help of the forward movement, it stays quite fixed. Okay. So this is probably one of the advantages yeah. we don't want to do a therapeutic approach is that with this uh, forward movement, which is applied on the tip of the scope, you have a relatively good stability. And unlike the double balloon, when you pull back, it's really rare to have the scope coming back for uh, 50 centimeters in one spot, and then you have to go back to, to examine the procedure. And when we are in front of the lesion, we can, of course, play a little bit with the, the, the spiral to advance a little bit to, to come back and to increase the stability. But here it's, um, it's also shows that sometimes the capsule can be misleading on the time of the, on the timings and your estimation if it's in the proximal or in the mid jejunum. Uh, here we had it uh, 30 minutes after the passage of the pillars, but we didn't have the cecum. So it's difficult really to estimate the whole length uh, related to the whole length of the, of the small bowel. Fair enough. Yeah, because we already have... Uh, We've progressed quite nicely here, and we're still progressing, but we haven't still seen something. Over the last uh, two minutes, it didn't progress so much, but uh, maybe this is the time when we have to pull back a little bit the scope while maintaining mm -hmm. the, the forward motion.
and then how big is it? But you see that I have no resistances, so uh, that's quite reassuring uh, that uh, we can still move. Uh, and you're having all this resistance, you think, because of prior surgery, or these things uh, in, in, a, in a normal small bubble? Yes, yeah, two colectomies, but uh, in the in the both studies of um, that we did with Düsseldorf, uh, we didn't include the post-surgical patients. Okay. But initially, I think we should, it's a bit amount of patients. So we stay optimistic as long as we can apply the, the motion uh, without resistance. When we have uh, the blockage of the system repeatedly, then we have to change a little bit the position to pull back the endoscope, of course. Another advantage of the system is that uh, basically it's a pediatric colonoscope, so you have a a large therapeutic channel which yeah. allows you to do almost all the procedures if you have a, 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 a therapeutic indication. So, Jack, we've been, um, um, you know, we have, we have watched uh, how this how this scope functions. So, what will be the plan um, uh, in case if you are going to be struggling for a while to to move this forward? Do you have any other plans in mind, or you'll just continue to persist with this? So, uh, looking at the timing of the capsule, I'm quite sure that we will reach the we will reach the lesion. Of course, this is probably not a very good case for live demo because. You know that enteroscopy can be boring a little bit, and uh, as long as we struggle, uh, we do not learn uh, many things. But uh, we we will, looking at the case, I'm quite sure that we will have some angles where we will stop like that, that one, but then we will be able to pass it and we will reach the lesion. So uh, I will not be discouraged uh, very early in uh, in such a case. We have seen that the lesion was quite uh, very well visible, so I would uh, definitely continue uh, for 10, 15 mm. minutes if it's necessary to to try to reach the lesion. Okay, and then, uh, you will, and then obviously you will do some biopsies and... Uh... And then, 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 of course, as I told you at the beginning, the purpose of this exam is to, is not to, to treat the lesion, but to take biopsies yeah, yeah. and to also to inject the uh, uh, India ink to, to help the surgeon to localize the lesion if the patient has to be operated on. Awesome. So sometimes changing the, pos the, the position of the patient yeah. may help. Uh, we have started with the patient in a left lateral position, which is... Uh, uh, the position that we prefer to start and the position which, wo which works most often. But here you see that... I Mariana think that we might uh, change the position here. All right, Mariana and Jack, you, we will watch you as long as we can and then if we have to transition, we'll go to the next case. But uh, it's a good demonstration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ja, sehr verehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ich darf Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen. Mein Name ist Andrea Patsche, ich bin Chefarzt der Gastroenterologie im Friedrich-Ebert-Krankenhaus in Neumünster und äh, neben mir steht äh, die Endoskopieschwester Christina Fiedler. Es geht heute um Infektionsschutz und Infektionsprophylaxe in der Endoskopie, ein Thema, was in allen endoskopischen Abteilungen immer wichtiger wird. Dazu gehört zum einen die ganz standardisierte Aufbereitung unserer Mehrfachinstrumentarien, äh, insbesondere auch der Endoskope selbst. Ähm, aber ähm, immer mehr ähm, wird Einwegmaterial hierfür verwendet, um zum einen den Patienten zu schützen, aber auch das Personal vor Infektionen zu schützen. Wir dürfen nicht vergessen, dass jeder Patient, der zu uns in die Endoskopieabteilung kommt, eigentlich als potenziell infektiös zu gelten hat. Deswegen 
gibt es Bestrebungen vieler Firmen, so auch von Olympus, ähm, Einwegmaterial auf den Markt zu bringen, das auch den Standard entspricht von den Materialien, die wir bislang aus der Endoskopie kennen. Das würden wir Ihnen heute gerne einmal zeigen. Was es, äh, gibt es hier Neues an Einwegmaterialien? Hierfür haben wir schon mal den üblichen Endoskopieturm mit einem Endoskop aufgestellt. Und wir werden jetzt einmal rüberschwenken ähm, zu den äh, Einwegmaterialien. Insbesondere geht es heute ähm, um Einwegventile, ähm, aber auch um neue Flaschen und äh, Schlauchsysteme, die äh, als Einwegmaterial bereits in vielen Endoskopien, so auch in, in unserer Endoskopie, zum Einsatz kommen und äh, wie wir äh, auch in unserem Alltag merken, äh, in einer äh, wirklich äh, sehr guten Qualität zum Einsatz kommen. Dann gehen wir einmal rüber. Ja, wir stehen jetzt hier äh, vor den sogenannten herkömmlichen Mehrwegventilen, einmal mit äh, dem Biopsieventil und mit dem Wasserventil und dem äh, äh, beziehungsweise mit unseren äh, Saugventilen. Das sind ja die Dinge, die Sie wahrscheinlich seit vielen, vielen Jahren in Ihren Endoskopien benutzen. Und es gibt jetzt von der Firma Olympus, auch von Olympus hergestellt, eben neue Einwegventile. Das sind die sogenannten Clever Shield Ventile, die, äh, wie Sie hier sehen, auch zusammengepackt äh, bereits geliefert werden. Und die wollen wir Ihnen einmal äh, jetzt hier zeigen. Ich ich darf Ihnen schon mal sagen, dass Sie die, die, diese Ventile bei uns in der Endoskopie schon äh, verwenden und tatsächlich äh, sind wir von der Qualität und der, Hand, äh, der Handhabung dieser Ventile absolut überzeugt. Ähm, und ähm, Sie sehen hier einmal das Biopsieventil ähm, und die beiden, also das Saug- und das Wasserventil bzw. das Luftventil, also von der Form natürlich äh, ganz ähnlich äh, den bereits äh, bekannten Mehrwegventilen. Wir werden die auch gleich im Endoskop einsetzen, aber ich darf jetzt einmal mal an Christina weitergeben. Wir wollen Ihnen einmal auch das Schlauchsystem für die Wasserflaschen einmal zeigen, was ebenfalls bei uns schon seit eigentlich längerer Zeit schon zum Einsatz gekommen ist. Und auch das Aufbereiten der Wasserflaschen eben absolut obsolet macht und dadurch auch durch wirklich hohe Hygienestandards entspricht. Ähm, zum einen ist es möglich, ähm, hier so ein Label anzubringen, damit man notieren kann, zu welchem Datum und zu welcher Zeit das ähm, System geöffnet worden ist. Zum anderen hat ähm, das System hier oben die Schläuche und der Deckel ist drehbar, sodass es halt beim Aufschrauben auf die Flasche nicht zu Verdrehungen kommt. Ähm, es handelt sich hier um einen sogenannten Hybridschlauch, ähm, weil wir mehrere Sachen mit ähm, einem System anschließen können. Und ähm, ich zeige einmal drüben am Turm, wie wir das machen. So, ähm, ich baue jetzt einmal das System ein. Das ähm, ist hier der Deckel, den schraube ich hier oben drauf. Das sieht man auch sehr gut, wenn man das hier zudreht, dann verdreht sich überhaupt gar nichts. Dieser kleine Teil wird hier oben an die Insufflation angeschlossen. Hier ist auch ein Adapter dazwischen, der ist auch 24 Stunden nutzbar, genauso wie das komplette Schlauchsystem. Dieser Teil ist für die ähm, Spülpumpe gedacht. Hier sind zwei Markierungen, die setze ich hier ein. Einmal runterdrücken. Und dann kann das Schlauchsystem an das Endoskop angeschlossen werden. Hier befindet sich noch ein Rückschlagventil, damit ähm, kein, keine Flüssigkeit in den Schlauch zurückfließen kann. Und äh, dieser Adapter muss äh, nach jedem Patientenkontakt gewechselt werden. Und der dritte Schlauch wird an das Endoskop angeschlossen. Das ist, wie Sie das schon kennen, die ganz normale Wasserflasche wird das hier angeschlossen. Beide Systeme haben eine Klemme, die man ähm, schließen und öffnen kann, um sie dann zu benutzen. Okay, also jetzt nochmal abschließend zurück zu den Ventilen, die wir jetzt schon äh, hier am Gerät eingesetzt haben. Und hier gibt es noch äh, einige Dinge, äh, die erwähnenswert sind. Zum einen äh, sehen Sie, dass, äh, die farbliche, äh, dass, dass die Ventile weiß sind. Das heißt, man kann sie sehr gut von den Mehrwegventilen unterscheiden. Äh, die Markierung äh, des äh, roten und blauen Ventils ist geblieben, wie auch in den Mehrwegventilen. Auch das Biopsieventil äh, für den äh, Biopsiekanal äh, ist zweifarbig, also auch das kann man äh, dann sehr gut unterscheiden. Ähm, und ganz wichtig ist äh, die Nachverfolgbarkeit, die Sie hier äh, anhand äh, des Barcodes äh, auf der Verpackung haben. Äh, es ist ja so, bei den Mehrwegventilen, wenn wir eine Nachverfolgbarkeit brauchen, dann läuft das ja immer über das Gerät. Ähm, und jetzt haben Sie wirklich äh, eine Nachverfolgbarkeit, Nachverfolgbarkeit der Ventile selbst. Das äh, ist sicherlich eine sehr große Hilfe, wenn es darum geht, Infektionsketten nachzuverfolgen.
Ja, an dieser Stelle dürfen wir uns äh, von Ihnen verabschieden und äh, wünschen Ihnen noch äh, ein schönes Meeting und äh, bis zum nächsten Mal. Very nice team, just a little bit north of Hamburg. So uh, we are going further west before we go south and then north again and then fly over the Atlantic. Our next station is Santiago de Compostela, where Julio is waiting for us. And we again uh, uh, hand over the moderation to Shyam. Hi, Shyam. Your second hey, moderation, this is uh, another live case. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hi, Julio. Okay. Good to see you. Hello, Shyam. It's very nice to see you always in the distance. Oh, welcome. So, first of all, I would like to thank Thomas, Alessandro, and all the endoscopy life team for the kind invitation to come to Santiago de Compostela. Of course, it's, although it's uh, a, in an extreme case. And first of all, just before I start the case, this is not a Julio's case. This is a, a case from the team of Santiago. And I have Jose Lariño. I think, uh, Shayam, you know Jose because yeah. we've met together yeah. when you've been in Santiago. We have Danny, which is uh, our... Um, another of the co-workers of the Pancreatic and AVS unit. We have the, um, my nurses, the anesthesiologist, and the, the team of IT from Frog that is helping us with this uh, transmission. But I think we are always late in these live cases, so if uh, we can go ahead with the case. So as you've seen in the slide, is a male, 72 years of age, uh, with a nice clinical picture because the patient is a cardiopathy, uh, it's also been admitted in dermatology because adverse events to aspirin and to gadolinium. So it's almost impossible to do an uh, additional MRI. And while at that admission, the patient was detected while doing the MRI as uh, cystic pancreatic lesions. So the goal of the case today is try to optimize the, the differential diagnosis of these lesions. We have an idea because we've just been checking the case, but we want to share with you how we can approach to manage these type of cases and, and how we can increase the diagnostic capabilities. Not only for the diagnosis, but how by AUS and AUS tissue acquisition, we can try to optimize the management of these patients. Awesome. So That's I cool. think we can switch to the endoscopy image. Of course, any comment, we have also Dani and, Julio, uh, Dani and Jose with me. Uh, so please, I am feel free to make any question while we're doing the, the case. Oh. But okay, we are in the stomach, now we are just taking a look at the liver, which is of course not the goal of the case, but I, al I also want to show you something new. We are working with the Arieta 850 and the Pentax scopes, and now we have a new technique, you know, I'm a big elastoman, Siam, uh, and now we have available the shear wave elastography, and at least I want you to show, but this is in the, in the beginning, under the US, but this is a technique for the future, probably, for the evaluation of, of for instance, liver disease, we need to check whether it's useful or not in, in pancreatic diseases. But this is how a shear wave uh, uh, behaves. It's like the other techniques of shear wave, but AUS guided. So we can just take a, a, a box uh, in the liver, and the patient is under deep sedation, which is going to be better for this type of, of technique. So we are going to perform the, the shear wave uh, measurement, and we will see in the picture, because we have been doing several uh, uh, measurements before, and you can see very nicely in the screen that we can see uh, in kilopascals, and we can see in some different measurements that today we maybe have the option to measure in a non-invasive way the fibrosis of the, of the liver, for instance. And, and this is a promising technique that, of course, we need to check. So this is what, something to show you that is now start to be available in our systems, and now we are using all the 850. So I am sure you're in, in Orlando, in the, your unit, you will have these systems that also work with the Olympus scope, so I think this is going to be nice and probably we'll need to find uh, if there is any position for this technique. But I think now we are going to the, to the case, so we are going to skip the liver. We are going to go uh, to check for the pancreas. So we're just advancing a little bit the scope. We're coming into position. We are going to turn a little bit of uh, clockwise, turn right, and then we are going to pull back the scope. Okay, and we start to see something in the pancreas, and this is one of the uh, cystic lesions that we start to see. I'm just trying to pull back. Okay, so we start to see there is a, 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 some several uh, small cystic pancreatic lesions. So I'm still withdrawing the scope. So I'm just uh, signaling with the arrow these cystic pancreatic lesions. On the other hand, uh, Jose, you are just to me, and what do you think about the, the pancreas? It seems to be a, a normal pancreatic parenchyma. 
Uh, no, not at all. It seems like an infiltration, a fat infiltration pancreas that is very commonly seen in these in this, uh, patients of uh, more than 70 years old, but not confused with a chronic pancreatitis. It's not a chronic pancreatitis. It seems like a fat infiltration. And so this uh, difficult a little bit the, the exploration of all the pancreas. But we are just now in the pancreatic body. We have the splenic uh, vein and the splenic artery. So now I'm just pulling back the scope. This is, a, as, as uh, Jose just commented, is a fat infiltration, but no signs of chronic pancreatitis. And here, this is probably the, the, the most important. Uh, so let me, I, I'm just going to change a little bit my position because this is probably the most important lesion. Here we can see this is a, a big lesion. I can tell you that the, in the MRI, there was a suspicion of a strange content that is not appearing in AUS, and we know that AUS is much better to see the content of this cystic lesion, so I'm going to try to see it again. So I'm just, I have the arrow just in the middle. Marita, me sujetas. We have just the arrow in the middle of the, of the cystic lesion. That is probably the big one. Let's go to measure this lesion. And Julio, you're using a regular uh, uh, linear scope, or is it a slim scope? Uh, I'm using the standard, the 38J10, it's the new therapeutic scope, 4.0 channel from, from Pentax. But it's true that I tend to use a very large image because I love to see everything big when I'm in, in front of the, what I'm seeing in the screen. And this is one of the good advantages of the new 850 is that the quality is very high even if you are very zoom in the, in the screen. So you increase your capability to detect the small, small lesions or the small artifacts or whatever you want to see when you're evaluating any kind of, of lesions. So, if we go to the standard image that we usually see, we, ha we have already set it up. So this is more common and we go deep that this is probably, and we increase a little bit. This is uh, how we usually see, but I really prefer to go to a, a, a more zoom image because for me it, it makes my, my, my appreciation, my evaluation uh, better. So I'm just coming back again. And here we have again the cystic lesion you can very nicely see. The big lesion that is probably the one that we need to target for, for try to, to FNA and, and, and we will try attempt to do a, a micro forceps biopsy. Uh, before going on, I'm just going to go quickly to the pancreatic head because one important message in uh, when you're evaluating a cystic pancreatic lesion and probably this seems to be a mucinous lesions because there's a, uh, multiple lesions. Uh, you need to see the complete pancreas because we know there is an increased uh, probability in these type of lesions to find solid lesions corresponding to a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So my recommendation, AUS is the most sensitive method for the detection of a small, solid pancreatic lesions. Don't stop in looking at the big one, just try to see the complete pancreas. And this is a very important message of today. Uh, this is not only a therapeutic tool, it's probably one of the best diagnostic tools we have for pancreatic diseases. So please complete always exploration. So, uh, well, I can tell you that Jose has already come to the pancreatic head and you will see that there's not only lesions in the pancreatic uh, body or in the pancreatic neck, but we have also detected some lesions that I want to show you. Cystic lesions, not solid ones. So I am coming to a um, short field that I really prefer. So we then deliver, we do. And this is probably the best reference for diagnostic approach. This is the portal vein, this is the splenic vein, we're in the confluence, so this is the pancreatic head, and this is another complex cystic lesion uh, that we have in the pancreatic head. This is another one, very much related. We have here, up here, the, the CBD, which is non-dilated. So uh, the important thing is we still see a fatty pancreas, we see cystic lesions, but we are not detecting uh, solid lesions in the exploration. So I'm making a uh, clockwise rotation so I'm coming to the ampulla. This is another cystic pancreatic lesion close to the ampulla. So initially, I make the question to Danny and to Jose, with these images, what would be your diagnostic approach in, in before doing anything else? Yeah, it's a presumed uh, IPMN, a multifocal branch that's IPMN. And so the question here is if we are going to puncture the big lesions or not, that we are going to assert in the, the next minutes about that. So what's your Julia, we have another three okay. minutes okay. Uh, before the, to, to end this transmission. So if you would like to biopsy or do something, we have three minutes to complete this procedure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What we are going to do, uh, anyhow, I think that the best lesion to target is the big one that is probably the one that is going to provide more information. And if we want to exclude dysplasia, 
uh, you need to go to the bigger one because the probability of finding this place is going to be higher in the bigger lesions. So before doing anything else, what I want to do uh, and also want to show you is doing a contrast enhancement because if there is something that we are missing in B mode, it can be enhanced uh, with contrast enhancement. So um, I really expect, hopefully, that it's going to be an a vascular lesion with no single uptake, no enlargement of the wall, but the best technique to exclude any of these worrisome features, mural nodules, enlarged wall, is to do contrast enhancement. So we are going to use Sonoview. I, know, I do not know if in, in, in Europe we are using Sonoview. I know the Japanese are using Sonathoid. I do not know what you are using in the, in the States, uh, Siam, and I don't know if you are with the Level Beast or with the Sona, Sonoview. But what we are using in, in, in Europe is, uh, is Sonoview from Braco. So I'm going to focus on the lesion again. Uh, I have uh, Alba, one of my nurses, shaking the, the son of you, which is uh, very important to do a good shaking because we need to mix the, the content with the bubbles uh, to avoid any problems while injecting. And the other very important message that is that the son of you should be injected directly, not by the side of the vein access, but directly, so we will skip uh, broken the bubbles and decreasing the quality of the study. We can discuss whether we can use 4.8, 2.4, the half of the complete vial. We usually go for the complete vial because according to the Spanish regulation, it's a little bit complex to split in different patients. And since this is the only lesion that we really want to evaluate, we will uh, give the complete uh, vial uh, at the same time. I mean, your lesion by EUS was uniformly anechoic. There was not even a question of a mural nodule and so on. So not really. I mean, uh, so you think injecting contrast will add any value? So are you primarily looking just for a thick wall so that you can target a biopsy? I, I believe that is a very good observation because from my experience, my point of view, um, I don't believe that the contrast enhancement in this particular case has any kind of uh, benefit because we mainly use when we have some kind of solid component inside the lesion, some mural nodule, but perhaps for the assessment of the, of the walls of the seas and to confirm that the walls are enhancing, that is different in the pseudocysts, that the pseudocysts are not enhancing at all at the walls, perhaps it's a possibility to use it. But I, I agree with you that we prefer to use it when we have some doubts about the solid mm -hmm. component inside the cyst. I mean, I, 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 was on, I, I was under the impression that Julio uses contrast even to brush his teeth. Ah, <laughs> uh, of course. Espera, que hemos perdido el... We've just, uh, the patient's just breathed and we just missed the lesion. Okay, let's try to find it again just for a second. Okay, aquí está. Okay, okay, okay. Sí. So very important, we need to decrease the focus to the distal part, not to avoid any interference. And I can tell you that the MRI, there was a suspicion of an enlarged wall. So although I don't believe with a B-mode image that there is nothing in the wall, I am very confident on, on giving contrast. And of course, I, I love to play and get videos of these very nice cases. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't enlarge more than one minute, the procedure, and there is no harm from for the patient because there is almost no contraindications. Mm -hmm. So we can very nicely see that there is no uptake at all. We can very nicely see that there is also no clear, no clear enlargement of the wall. So this is a very good sign for the patient. There is no nodules inside. And again, there is no enlargement of the wall. But this is one of the things that you, there's another tool that you have in your, in your hands eh, in order to, to evaluate these, these lesions. So you will just now aspirate this with a 19 gauge needle, I presume? No, yes. yes, we will try. We will try. Because even if it's a lesion, sometimes when we want to make a, a, an access with the 22 or the 25, it is a little bit difficult to obtain a good uh, sample. So I think uh, the access of the scope is not, not so bad. And we will try. And if, it were, if we're able to place the moray, we will try to, to use the moray to exclude if there is any kind of a strange uh, finding. Uh, we are just also trying to work together with the pathologist uh, in order to try to optimize the uh, differentiation between the subtypes of uh, IPMN, which is my suspected case in this, uh, in this patient because we know the malignant potential in the different subtypes is completely different. 
And probably if we're able to detect that there is a, a low malignant potential, probably I will be more confident with this almost four centimeter lesion, even to try to keep it under surveillance instead of talking to my surgeon. So and we're working with them very strongly, and we will try. But if not, we will just switch to a 22. So I will let Jose, because he's the one we usually work together. So Jose, while I'm explaining the, the, what we're going to use, Okay. So, Julio, do you give intermedicine to all your uh, suspected side branch IPMN before a FNA? Do you believe in it? Uh, no, we don't give uh, NSAIDs in these cases. Not really. I mean, uh, it's not a matter. I, I think we are lacking of evidence to try to detect if whether it's really useful or not. Our experience in post-acute pancreatitis when we access these lesions is almost uh, uh, zero cases uh, over the last uh, yes, so initially we, we don't. Uh, and my question now, I, I give another question to you, Shyam. What do you think about antibiotics? Are you still using antibiotics or you skip now antibiotics? I mean, we, you know, the uh, recent paper on gastro tells you that antibiotics is not required, but we do antibiotics. There's a 10% chance that when you aspirate cysts less than 15 millimeters on side branch IPMN, we can cause FNA induced pancreatitis, so we also do indomethacin. But Julio, uh, it's been a good demonstration. I think we're going to take uh, we're going to take a break off to the next procedure. So thanks to you and uh, your team uh, in Santiago okay. for this fantastic demonstration. Okay, thank you. Take care then. Bye bye. Bye bye. Pues quita eso y somos una. The FDA did post-marketing studies indicating a 5% rate of culture-positive scopes despite reprocess. That's a huge failure rate. One in 20 patients is at risk. That's something that should really wake us all up and have us look at what we can do better and how we can redesign scopes. 
disposable tips of scopes will help, but it's not the long-term answer. Either the reusable scopes have to come out of something better, where um, complete sterilization is actually possible, or I think the future is going to align with disposable scopes. Clearly, where the field is going is towards use of single-use device. And the more we try and the more we get familiar with it, because it's going to be a game change for the, for the field of interventional endoscopy. Once I began the procedure, I completely could not tell I was using a disposable instrument. I forget I'm using a disposable scope and I'm working on this. I think what we're living through right now is the beginning of a transformation in healthcare where we're going to look back 10 years from now and say, I can't believe we were using you know, scopes that we reused over and over again. So it gives us a nimbleness to address clinician needs. It gives us the ability to iterate on a pace that has never been seen before. And it manages some really serious problems in endoscopy in a way that, that no one's ever been able to do before. everyone. Mamrita Sethi here speaking to you from Milan. Small change in plans from earlier this morning, but I'm going to give Thomas a little bit of relief while he gets prepared for endoscopy. So we will now take a um, short trip over the channel to the UK, where we'll join uh, Rehan Hedry and Brian Saunders in London. And our moderation today will be done um, by Sergei Kushin from Yaroslav Russia. He's a director of, uh, he's an associate professor of surgery and endoscopy at the Yaroslav Regional Cancer Hospital. Sergey, great to see you again. Thank you for inviting me. It's my privilege to introduce London team. London is the capital of uh, innovations in Barrett's esophagus as well as in colonoscopy. Hi, Rihan. Hi, Brian. Good afternoon, Sergey. Thank you for the, the, the kind uh, introduction. Uh, welcome from a, a very rainy uh, London uh, and UCLH. A big thank you to uh, Thomas and Alessandra and the endoscopy on our team. Fantastic to be part of this wonderful global uh, uh, event. So we're going to start with a, with a case of a, a patient with um, uh, Barrett's neoplasia. And we're going to demonstrate, you, dem demonstrate to you a device that's been uh, explored in the field of ablation, which is the cryo balloon by CD Therapeutics and, and Pentax. Um, so we've got a patient here who's had a, an intramucosal cancer, which had an endoresection uh, and resulted in quite a significant stenosis requiring multiple dilatations. And they had residual about C2M5 Barrett's and has had a single session of, of cryo balloon therapy under the remit of a, a study that we're doing with my a good friend and colleague, Baz Voiston, Eurocoldplay. So this is the device that we use for, for, for cryo balloons. So the, this, this device here, was, we're very privileged, we're still the only side in the UK doing this, but this is uh, Trixie, my fantastic assistant, who's holding a second generation uh, a controller here. And this has had a, a software update, and what you can't see is all automated. There's a digital supply here. And there's two different types of catheter for cryo balloon. There's this catheter here, which I'm just going to blow up now, which is a straight catheter. It's 10 centimeters long. 
uh, and has a diameter of about 30 millimeters. That doesn't really matter because the compliance is low. It's about 4.5 PSI. And, and what we have in the controller is we have a nitrous oxide canister. So this is what's going to be delivered through the controller into this balloon, which works through the working channel of a scope and will oppose the, the, the mucosa of the, uh, the, the Barrett. So what I, I don't know if you can see uh, as you zoom in, the, the, there is a little control nozzle in here, which will uh, deliver the, um, uh, the cryo uh, therapy. So you can see it just begins to freeze over the catheter. There are two different types of balloon. There's a straight balloon here, which I've just demonstrated to you here. And then there's a second type of balloon, which is called the pear-shaped balloon. I'll give you this, this to you guys. The, the benefit of the pear balloon is that it's ideal for scarred segments of, 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 of esophageal uh, neoplasia. Because as you can see in this patient here, I've got an endoscope down. This is a, a Pentax EG 34i10 scope. And the benefit of this scope is it, 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 we don't compromise on the optics of the wonderful eye scan imaging. It's got a 3.8 working channel, which means that I can get a, uh, can you just push the controller to my foot? You can get uh, the, the cryo balloon down. So I've got Vinay Segal here, one of my consultant colleagues. So you can see here, ladies and gents, you've got a, a pretty, pretty, sorry looking esophagus because of what we've done to it. There's a lot of scarring here on the posterior wall from the endoscopic resection. And then you've got an asymptomatic stenosis here, which then sort of curves across to the right into the, the top above a massive hiatal hernia like a lot of these patients do. So I now switch to the optical imaging that these scopes give us. This lady had five centimeters of Barrett at her last treatment. She's had a decent response from the index cryo balloon, but it's a very anatomically challenging uh, uh, esophagus. And so one of the advantages of cryo here is that it allows you to uh, use a balloon like the pear-shaped balloon that I'm going to show you, which is, as the name suggests, not a straight balloon, but it has a, a, a bigger proximal end and a shorter distal end, almost like a pear upside down. There's also a lot of scarring here. And you know, this lady is going to struggle if we were using conventional RF ablation with the Barak system in terms of getting access to the casters and also uh, the risk of lacerating the tissue, but also getting good tissue apposition. This area here, you can see with the optical imaging, this is not worrying. This is just sort of a bit of hyperplastic, a bit of uh, regenerative tissue around the stricture. It's been sampled and it's non-displastic. So what we're going to demonstrate to you here, ladies and gentlemen, is the use of the pear-shaped balloon. And, and so this goes down the working channel of the endoscope. I have a foot pedal here at my right foot, which is going to allow me to do everything that I need to do. So you'll begin to see there is the pear-shaped balloon. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blow it up for you in the stomach so I can demonstrate to you what it looks like um, compared to the straight balloon. So you can see that it has a more a sort of bigger proximal end, and then it sort of just cones down at the, at the bottom end. And that's beneficial for these types of esophaguses where you basically have a, a lot of asymmetry and scarring. You might ask, what's the benefit of, of cryo in these cases? We don't know. We're, we're still working on, on collating perspective data in treatment naive patients. We've shown that in treatment refractory patients, this will have a role. Uh, and, 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 and you know, studies will begin to inform its role. There's already good data from the US. Mm -hmm. So the other challenging aspect of this esophagus is there's a bit of a pseudo diverticulum that we've created as a result of the endoresection. So I've blown up the balloon here. And what I'm trying to do is just to get a nice stable position within the stricture. And I'm just going to use my scope to angle up to the tip of the balloon just to get a good, good visualization and allow me to start the, the ablation. So what this new generation of catheters allows you to do is you can see that in the sort of one o'clock position along the rim of the catheter, there are these little white spots, which is a new addition. And I really commend the company for doing this. And what this allows you to do 
is on my foot pedal, you'll see I can move the catheter around. And this gives you and the ability to be able to follow the device round in terms of where you're going to deliver your cryo spray. So not only can I move the device uh, clockwise and, and anti-clockwise as I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen, but I can also then begin uh, to move it in the, in the vertical axis. So I can bring it towards me like I am here, and then I can take it away from me which allows me to then treat areas that are at the oral end and at the anal end with, uh, you know. The difficult bit here is where does one position the balloon in a segment like this where things are a little bit challenging anatomically? Mm -hmm. And also knowing that you don't need to get all the Barrett's in one go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see if I can try and anchor the middle of the balloon across that stricture. So I've got a little bit of backward traction on the, on the balloon here, knowing that the balloon is going to want to go south here. So I'm going to gently inflate the balloon here. And I'm going to ask my assistant just to hold the endoscope at the bite block for me. And I'm just going to gently Rikhan. pull the balloon. Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, Rikhan, uh, okay. sorry. Uh, is it possible to perform balloon dilation with cry balloon? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, no, because the, 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 the radial force that is generated from expanding this balloon is, 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 is not high enough. Uh, and so it's, the PSI, I think it's about 4.5. It's not enough, as you can see here, uh -huh. to cause any sort of mucos mucosal uh, irritation. So I'm just going to switch to my enhanced imaging here. And I'm just going to see if I can try and find a stable position just proximal to the stricture. And the key here is to move your scope into the balloon. There we go. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the spray part of the catheter towards me. And then I'm going to start to ablate. And you'll see how I've got a nice stable position here. And you'll begin to see the, the ablation begin in the sort of five o'clock position. And I'm comfortable here because I know that I don't need to be a 100% accurate in terms of where the balloon is, because I've got a lot of maneuverability here in terms of where my ablations are going to go. So I'm very carefully here using my left hand and my left shoulder just to help to maneuver the endoscope in the area that I want to go. And because you have a narrow caliber esophagus here, one of the benefits of this is that the, the, the spray really, it, it, it really does spread quite nicely. So you don't need to be too aggressive and you'll know that you'll get just here with three ablations, I've got this nice sort of Christmassy feel to my esophagus, where we've almost completely ablated the entire area. What I'm going to do is just hit this area here at one o'clock. And you know, full marks of the team at C2 and Pentax, these little markers have made a big difference, it gives us a better visibility. In terms of what we're treating it means that we, we don't under treat patients, but you know, just as importantly, we don't over treat patients because the risk of stenosis uh, it can be, you know, not insignificant. So, so what you can see here, Sergei, is we treated within the stricture quite nicely. And what happens in a few moments, you'll see this sort of erythema from the treated areas begin to appear. Now we're going to try and just see if we can treat the areas above the stricture. And you have two options here. One, you can use the manual inflation of the balloon, which is sometimes attractive when you've got a stable balloon uh, position, or you can actually, you can, you can inflate the balloon with a syringe. Now here, I think I'm going to be okay. And I'm just going to bring the, the, the spray nozzle towards me because I kind of know where the Barrett's is. It's in the one o'clock position. So I'm going to do a couple of spray, sort of test sprays as I call them. And then you can see my markers here in the sort of, they're in the 12 o'clock position now there. And that's, you know that the spray is going to come out on the other side. So we're just going to be a little bit braver here and see if I can go across. And I'm happy with that. So you can see how the balloon has really helped me to guide my spray into that island that was up in the one o'clock position. Now I know, even though I can't see it, is that on the contralateral wall in the sort of six o'clock position, seven o'clock position, 
just tucked away behind the stricture, there's a little bit of Barrett's. So I'm just going to treat that here, and I'm going to treat that like this because I know the spray is dissipating away from me into that little crevice. And I know that I'm not over-treating here, and I'm getting really good coverage. So what we do here is what you can't see what's happening in the background. The team have just changed the cartridge. So I've done seven ablations with one nitrous oxide uh, canister. Can I have a look at the canister, guys? Yeah. So that's what it looks like. Um, some of you that go to sort of recreational music festivals may be familiar with this device, I'm told, but I, I wouldn't know this. So you normally get about six or seven sprays with one of these canisters. The team are just going to change the, the canister. So this is a real, a real uh, a progressive move by the company with this new balloon and the new, uh, the new device because it really gives me control in terms of being able to Rican. target. Are ready to go? Rehan, uh, what is the safety profile of cryo balloon ablation compared with RFA? Yeah, great call, great question. Uh, so the issue that you know we're all faced with with endoluminal therapy in the esophagus is the risk of stenosis and stricturing. Uh, and you know we know with combined ER and with an RF, the stricture rate is in the region of about ten percent. Mm -hmm. So there are sort of hypothetical advantages of this device because of uh, the, the the cryo uh, essentially uh, because of the sort of rapid freeze thaw sequence. Uh, the, the, the sort of hypothesis or the null hypothesis is that, you know, the, the, the submucosa is preserved. Now, um, the sort of preliminary readouts on this show that actually the stricture aid is not dissimilar to, to what we're seeing in, uh, in, 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 in RFA, but, you know, the data will inform me. But at the moment, it, it appears the stricture aid is, is probably the same. Mm -hmm. So here, Sergey, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to treat that little island, and, and you can, you know, you 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 can treat one area knowing that the 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 the, the freeze is going to spread over a surface area, and you're going to get good coverage of the entire Barrett's. Now, the other thing I've not touched on, Sergey, is the duration of treatment. In in RFA, we talk about dosimetry in terms of joules. Uh, here, we talk about how long we expose the mucosa to to the nitrous oxide and. Uh, the current protocol is eight seconds of exposure. And so actually, I'm going to just call it a day here because you, you can see this lovely sort of um, this is a deep red sort of burgundy appearance, uh, which is the, the, these areas have all been treated. Um, within the stricture here, you can see how it's beginning to, uh, to discolor, discolor from the, the, the sort of mucosal hemorrhage. Um, and you can see we've treated here circumferentially around the GOJ within the stricture and then on also this end here at the oral margin. So this patient will now go home today. Uh, we'll get them back in about three months and they'll probably need a bit of a touch up. But, you know, just to summarize, uh, you know, nice endoscope, good imaging, uh, great access through the working channel. And you know, a big, big step forward for the balloon in terms of the ability to treat difficult anatomies like this, but also be able to streamline your treatment. You know, being able to see where your spray is going to come out, anticipate where you're going to be able to treat and plan your treatment. Um, you know, much, much better with the second generation uh, device. And you know, hopefully the clinical outcomes will will follow, Sergey. Rehan, thank you so much. And the last question to you. Is cryotherapy for Barrett's esophagus a cool alternative to RFA or ABC? What do you think? Yeah, I like the word, the cool alternative. I think it is, at present, uh, has a place in, in the treatment of refractory neoplasia in Barrett's and in the treatment of patients with difficult anatomy that would be difficult to access with the conventional uh, ablative tools. As a, as, a, as, an, as, a, as a first line alternative to de novo virgin Barrett's, uh, we, we don't know yet. We don't have that head to head data. Uh, and so, you know, that, that will be collated prospectively. But certainly in those two indications that I've mentioned to you, it's got a, it's got a really good role with evidence to back, uh, back its efficacy. Okay, thank you so much. So I think you, you've got the, the guys in, in the other room now going to show you some colonoscopy and then we'll come back and show you some, uh, some more uh, interesting upper GI stuff.
So we are moving to the colonoscopy room. Hello. Sure. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hello. Please introduce the case. Yes. Hi. I'm, I'm Brian Saunders, and I'm here with Ed, Ed Seward in uh, room two at UCH. Um, Hi, Brian. We're assisted by Emily Aronistis, and Mons is on my right. Um, we're going to just introduce the case to you. This is actually our plan B, not our plan A, because plan A, which was a large sequel polyp, didn't take the bowel preparation. So we're on to plan B. So Ed, just this is sure. your patients. So this is a 57-year-old lady who was referred up with a, a slightly positive fit, a fit of 19 and uh, abdominal pain. And we've been using colon capsule at UCLH to increase our uh, colon capacity and she had several left-sided polyps that were detected on the colon capsule so she proceeded to a colonoscopy which unfortunately failed due to pain so it's being repeated today uh, under propofol deep sedation. So um, I was very pleased you gave me this difficult case um, to <laughs> Ed but uh, we've we've got the Optivista, uh, the Pentax Optivista Plus system so knowing that this had been a, te a technically difficult, previously failed colonoscopy due to diverticular disease in the sigmoid colon, I've used the paediatric scope, uh, which is just 11.8 millimeters in diameter. And we've used the scope pilot system here. And I've managed to, to squeeze past the diverticular disease. She had a very high splenic flexure, which we then pulled back and straightened and a reverse splenic flexure loop, which again, I derotated. And finally, we've managed to get round into the cecum. Um, when you get to the cecum, the first thing is always just to assess the cecal landmarks. And you can see the ileo cecal valve fold uh, bottom right. We just go in a little bit and put some gas in. You can start to see the appendix orifice in the corner. Um, here, we can't use a cuff or a cap uh, because of the slightly fixed uh, diverticular disease. And I think uh, nowadays for root, more routine procedures, a cuff or a cap is, is, is preferable. Uh, but you can s clearly see the appendix orifice there, uh, nice and normal. This is an area where you quite often get serrated pathology, uh, sessile serrated polyps, but there's no uh, abnormality there. We're using the um, Discovery AI system from Pentax. So you may well see a blue sort of square coming up uh, occasionally if we see a polyp. Um, I'm just going to pull back a fraction now. And um, Ed, do you want to comment on the capsule? Why why was the capsule done? Why not a colonoscopy? Sure. So um, colon capsule, I think, is sort of finding its way in, in uh, investigation of lower GI symptoms. And for low risk patients, so so a fit of 19, um, we would anticipate the colorectal cancer risk is in the order of one percent. Uh, in North London, and so for most patients, we would have, we would expect that a they would have a colon capsule. It would be normal, and then no further investigations would be required. But about twenty percent of the time, uh, there are going to be polyps there, and then you're into a discussion about what you do with those polyps. Uh, and obviously, if the patient's very elderly, you can afford to leave diminutive polyps, but for a patient in their 50s, personally, I'd feel uncomfortable leaving adenomas in situ. Now, there's a big national trial of the capsule colonoscopy in 10,000 patients going on. Do you want to just tell us yeah, a little bit about that? So, so the NHS have invested uh, heavily in, in colon capsule um, for two reasons. Number one, you get additional lower GI investigation capacity. And secondly, we also have the ability to investigate patients at home so we can send the capsule out in an Amazon parcel and the patient can sit in their armchair in their front room uh, and take the prep uh, and that's particularly useful if you have a patient who's been shielding uh, you know in the in the first part of the pandemic so it offers a lot of flexibility and I think so long as you're choosing to investigate lower risk patients I think colon yeah. capsule is a good option. 
how many of those 10,000 patients do you think the capsule is going to get stuck? Because it's well, a lot bigger than a, than a standard capsule. It is, but the because you're using it in a different population from your small bowel capsule patients, actually the capsule retention rate is uh, incredibly low. That's not the issue. Fantastic. So just getting back to the endoscopy, we've, we've popped into the term Lilian, and I'm just flicking through the different uh, imaging modalities on the uh, Pentax OptiVista system. But here, this is iScan 1, which gives you sort of an inc increased color enhancement. You can see the villi quite nicely there. And then I go over to uh, iScan 3, uh, which is a blue light imaging post-processor technique. And again, you can see the, uh, the villi quite nicely. The, uh, the discovery is picking up there, of course, that's not a polyp, it's a lymph follicle in the term Lilian. And all the AI systems, they, they have quite a high false positive rate. Um, and there are, there are how, six or seven, eight, maybe eight systems now commercially available. Mm. Um, and that, this is, a, this is a, an area where I think they have to improve a little bit um, to uh, give us more in the way of, um, of, of accuracy, because if you get a lot of distraction, that can be an irritation. But of course, they, they, they do come into their own when they're picking up polyps there. It's sort of flashing, slightly picking up the IOC called valve. What, um, what you notice, though, is it doesn't stay fixed on the, on, on the valve. Uh, once we move away from it, it's not uh, showing uh, an abnormality there. Now I'm starting my withdrawal on the way back. And we're just gradually having a look around. The washing pump is just such an advantage nowadays with the scope. We can clean and wash as we go. The capsule didn't show any abnormality in this uh, proximal colon. We've, of course, got carbon dioxide to look. Um, I can feel, when, I, when I'm manipulating the scope, I can feel that the sigmoid is still slightly fixed and slightly angulated um, from the diverticular disease. So we have to be careful. And when you're intubating a difficult colon with a fixed sigmoid, you have to be careful, not just during the insertion, but also during the withdrawal. If you pull back aggressively or quickly, you can cause a, 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 a mucosal tear or perforation. So just very slow controlled movements. And we're just manipulating using the washing pump. Here, the washing pump sort of at uh, seven o'clock uh, just to wash the mucosa. And I, I like this eye scan mode with the enhancements. What do you think, Ed? Do you have a preference? Uh, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of eye scan one. The, um, <coughs> the focus on uh, surface irregularities is, is really helpful um, in terms of, because often there are uh, so tonal or, or color uh, changes to a polyp that just that catch the eye. And those um, differences are exacerbated with uh, yes. iScan1, so I, I find I it enormously right. helpful. Sorry, Brian, Ed, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we have to move to Rihan in uh, five minutes. Let me ask you about the role of artificial intelligence in colonoscopy. What do you think yes. about discovery? Uh, what are your impressions? Well, this is actually the first time I've used it. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm thinking it's, it's probably very accurate for picking up polyps. Um, of course, when you're an experienced colonoscopist, you hope that you'd be able to pick most of them up without the need for artificial intelligence. But I think for the less experienced, it may well be useful. And the preliminary data does seem to show um, an advantage. Um, but I think it's the beginning of the journey, and I'm sure the systems will get progressively more accurate. And when they include characterizations, that, that, that's a, just a, a venous... Uh, uh, a vein underneath the mucosal surface there that it's picking up, that's not a polyp. Um, when it gets more, more accurate and combines characterization, I think it'll be very compelling at that point. So I think we're at the beginning of that journey and there will be significant improvements uh, just around the corner that'll make it very useful. I think the, where it'll come in in particular is with quality control. Uh, there's all sorts of very simple metrics that can be done, for instance, recording the sequel intubation, the quality of the bowel preparation, that type of thing, giving you an automatic scoring in ulcerative colitis, for instance, and, and those programs are being worked on. One thing that's crucial when you're examining the colon is, though, the colon is under the influence of gravity, and you, you should be proactive in changing the patient's position. So here we've come back around hepatic flexure, 
with the transverse, it's starting to be a little bit collapsed. It's more difficult to change the patient's position under propofol because she's asleep, but you should still do it, particularly if there's concern uh, or you need to get at good access for polypectomy. Yeah. I mean, for instance, I, I'll quite often move the patient over into the right, right lateral position for the cecum, and here the optimal position is over on, into the transverse colon. Actually, we're getting quite good views, so we don't really need to, to, uh, to do that at the moment. But as we come but, back... But the possible drawback um, of the system is the potential number of false positive results. Yes, that's a, we've already seen that here, that it's picked up you know, the terminal ileal lymph follicles and the, and the ileocecal valve. It, doesn't, it will never take away the need for us as endoscopists to be making the clinical decisions and making them correctly and understanding exactly what we're looking at um, using the different electronic imaging modalities. And there's still, I think, quite a lot of work to be done in really delineating what we're seeing and linking that with histopathology. So I think it's, it's an exciting time uh, for AI, but it's, it's never going to do away with the need for the endoscopist to manipulate the scope and, and get those views and be, be absolutely meticulous about that. Um, and the endoscopist understanding what, they are, what they're seeing and selecting what they remove and what they don't remove. Um, the AI will never make those decisions um, though it will be a good guide, I think, in the future uh, with characterization. And it'll probably come in post therapy, you know, the, looking at the EMR or ESD defect will be really useful, I think, um, to give us ideas about risk of bleeding. Should we close the entire defect with clips? Should we apply some, one of these uh, uh, hydrogels to help with healing? Uh, we're, it, is it a complete excision? And I noticed when you when you did the rounds earlier on, talking about what one thing would you get across? What's what's the biggest advance? To me, it's and I'm sure Ed, Ed would agree with this. It's when you see a lesion, a significant lesion, mm -hmm. your first time is the best time to remove it definitively. Um, we we can remove virtually anything if it's de novo and it's not been previously um, uh, had diathermy injury to it. So really, we need to spend more time looking and, and uh, assessing lesions and then planning a proper resection, a bit like you would with a cancer resection. You know, these big polyps, they are potential cancers and they need to be treated as such. And we need to really plan that properly um, and tee up a single definitive resection where the patients are then not needing to come back repeatedly uh, for multiple procedures, which is costly, is not good for the planet, certainly not good for the patient. Um, and may end up in surgery anyway. Well, that's my little preach. Ed, what would you, what would you say in terms uh, of... Uh, Brian, of, uh, uh, sorry, we have one question from the audience. Uh, what yeah. protocol oh. is issued to a patient who underwent colonoscopy using an artificial intelligence system? What do you think? So I'm not with you. What, what do you mean? What protocol? Uh, uh, protocol of examination. Uh, so, do we yeah. tell the patients that we're using AI? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we don't currently. I mean, it's just part of the standard setup in the same way that we might use the scope yeah. pilot or anything else. Um, but I can see what you mean. There may come a time when the artificial intelligence is giving us marks out of 10. Saunders go back in and re examine <laughs> it. And then we have a slight medico legal problem, which I don't think anybody's completely thought through. Um, but I suppose, uh, is it better to, to know that you've done a bad examination? I, it has to be, doesn't it, from a patient perspective? And maybe we do have to go back in and examine. It's, I mean, it's certainly data that's being uh, is planned to be collected uh, in the UK on every endoscopy is whether the procedure was done with AI or not. And you would imagine it's um, it's it's a step away from being a quality metric. And I think. Uh, from a patient's point of view, uh, if you know that AI is going to improve your adenoma detection by 30%, then you'd want AI, even in uh, Professor Saunders's hands, you know, uh, the AI will give... percent is a very big increase in ADR. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Depends where you're coming from. Depends where yeah. your starting point is. But yeah. the, um, 
I think uh, it makes sense to me. And I think pa patients are becoming increasingly aware. And certainly I consent for missed lesions whenever I consent for, a, for an endoscopy. And, yes. um, you know, it's an issue. One of, so one of the thank you very I'm... much. We are moving to another room to and uh, back to Rihan Hedri. Okay. Rihan. How many patients have you had the sponge at UCH now? Rihan, can you hear me? Hi, Sergey. How are you we, doing? We have just a couple of minutes. Please uh, introduce uh, Cyta Sponge briefly. Okay, no worries. So, <clears throat> Sergey, we're going to um, uh, just you know uh, 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 summarize our experience of what happened during COVID uh, and and our Barrett surveillance uh, cohort. So, <clears throat> you know, unless you've been um, uh, hibernating in Alaska, you will have not, uh, you know, you, everyone will have noticed the severe impact that COVID had on, on endoscopic provision, uh, not just the therapeutic stuff that we're seeing today, but as importantly, the, the diagnostics and the, the, uh, the, the surveillance uh, uh, for patients who were uh, indefinitely postponed due to the, the, the issues around virus transmission, uh, ensuring the hospitals were, were had a reasonable capacity to deal with a pandemic protect our patients, but as importantly, protect our staff. Um, and, and, you know, as the first wave set in around Europe and the world, there was a lot of societal guidance and what we should and shouldn't do based on protecting patients, triaging and validating patients. Uh, and, and, and really that was a, you know, a big push on, you know, what, exploring how we could look at these patients differently. And, and the issue here was what happened if we just waited, if we waited until COVID was over, what would happen and essentially all the modeling in the context of esophageal cancer uh was certainly in the uk <clears throat> that we would have a significant amount of undiagnosed esophageal cancer and the burden and comorbidity from that would show with increase in around six percent uh, at, at, at five years um so what do we do there was uh, esge guidance asge guidance and also there was uh, bsg guidance which was to look at how we could um, uh, triage patients in terms of um, uh, who would need an emergent endoscopy and who could wait. And for patients with Barrett's esophagus, the guidance was that we would have to postpone these patients up until which point in the sunset on COVID and, and, and we were uh, scoping again. And you can see, this is Matt Rutter's paper, the impact on the volume of endoscopy done through our NED database plummeted uh, in March of last year, and only now we're beginning to pick up the pieces. So this is what happened to us at UCLH. We're a big tertiary center for Barrett's. Uh, and we went from doing about 40 surveillance patients uh, a month to really doing very little. Uh, and this is followed through uh, Barrett's. And so this led me and our team to look at how can we uh, uh, bring in non-endoscopic modalities that would allow us to pick up early disease, uh, keep patients happy and safe that we still cared about them, but also protect our patients. Um, and following societal guidelines of every three to five years of endoscopy, we began to accumulate a massive backlog of patients. And so what the options, the options were the sponge. We've been involved academically with Record Fitzgerald's team at Addenbrooke's, who have really paved the way on this. And then as Medtronic and the team at Addenbrooke's started a partnership last year, I engaged with uh, with them, and they were fantastic and dynamic in allowing us to introduce a site sponge at UCLH. Uh, you know, we were the first center in the world to use this outside of a research study. So what this is, is a, 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 a CE mark device. Uh, it is a, a, a capsule uh, which is swallowed by a patient. Uh, it has a gelatinous capsule. It dissolves in your stomach, and then we pull it up, and it brings up a representative sample of cells that are indicative of not just Barrett uh, with TFF3, but also cellular atypia uh, and P53. Uh, so we, 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 we couldn't get a live patient for you today, so we had to hire in a, a male model to, uh, to demonstrate. So this is what would happen in real life. This is what the sponge looks like. This is Sally, one of our nurses. 
This is what it looks like when you yank it out of the esophagus. Um, and this will get a representative sample of cells. So the, uh, the, the, the patient in question here will swallow the capsule uh, and vigorously drink, you know, four to five uh, 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 glasses of warm water, which is really important because this helps the gelatin to dissolve in the stomach. Uh, we then wait for a, a, a seven minute period during which time we're absolutely sure that the gelatin has dissolved. And then you can see what Sally's doing here is she is uh, pulling out the capsule uh, and it's, it's, it's not very aesthetically uh, pleasing for those watching. And there you go, you get a representative sample of cells on that uh, sponge. So we've done about 120 patients at UCH during the COVID lockdown. We've picked up five cancers. And so the patient we're just about to show you very quickly before we go on to the next center, a uh, gentleman who had a sponge, Barrett surveillance was never gonna get his endoscopy, had a sponge which was positive, came back for an endoscopy that demonstrated uh, a lesion that was resected, which was an M3 cancer. And he has come back now for radiofrequency ablation with, uh, with, with RFA. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to Vinay Segal, who's my consultant colleague here, who's then gonna just demonstrate the case uh, and really, this, this highlights how, you know, innovation and science and research have paved the way for us integrating technologies, um, you know, sooner than we would have liked, but really helping patients. So we found the, the disease, and now we're going to show you how we, we treat it with, uh, with Vinay over here. So Vinay, just talk us through what you're doing and what you're seeing. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rahan. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Rahan. Thank, Thank you. you. For the kind invite to present. So this is a gentleman who has a long segment of Barrett, 16 centimeters. He's had a previous EMR, which is a real high-grade dysplasia. So he's come back for a reassessment with the aim of ablating his long segment of Barrett that he has left. So I, before uh, you came across to me, I'd already inspected the Barrett's to make sure there were no visible lesions so that it's safe to proceed with the RFA. I'm now deploying a Jaguar, which will be used to railroad over the RFA catheter. We'll be using an express catheter a self-sizing catheter by Medtronic. Um, so I'm just going to come down here and measure up where the top of the Barrett segment it's is. A very long segment to Barrett, okay. you know, isn't it? Gosh. Uh, so we're back. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, uh, we, we have just five minutes for this uh, procedure. No problems. Please, no problems, that guy. Please explain briefly. So and, tr and try to do yeah. it. So the top of the Barrett's here yeah. is at 22 centimeters. So the why will now be left in and we'll bring over the catheter. So Vinay, why, why, why are you using the Express in, in this patient? So, you know, the, um, you know, the, we saw cry balloon earlier, but the, you know, what, what about this Barrett's is, is, is special about the, 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 you know, what about this catheter is unique to this type of Barrett's? So the main primary advantage of using this catheter is that we'll get a, a larger- uh, So can we just focus area. in on, on Vinay's hands here, team? So you can see that he's got this, four centimeter RFA Express device, which you know was introduced several years ago and has really helped to streamline delivery of RF ablation because it's a self-sizing catheter, which means it sort of auto-sizes the, the minimum diameter of the, the catheter of the esophagus. So Vinay is just inserting the device down now, Vinay. Any tips and tricks for putting this in? So we'll go, we'll go over a wire, plenty of sedation because It can be a little bit uncomfortable. I'm just gonna go through down there now. There we go. Okay. So once that's down, very nice. We will get the endoscope down side by side. Someone please hold the scope there for me. Hold that there, please. Okay. okay. We'll go back with the endoscope now. So before I uh, put the wire down, it's important to say that I clean the Barrett's with uh, a mucolytic agent. Mm. I'm gonna push the castle down a bit more, don't you? Further. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Bit of trauma here at the back. Okay. Let me just pull the scope back here. Okay. Just get the scope out. Can we get a bit of uh, just negative traction on the wire? Okay. So let's just uh, put some. So you want to just try and put that in with a bit of negative. Keep the keep the cast straight. Bring his chin up a bit, guys. Thank you. Let's pull back on the wire a bit, please. And down you go, Vinay. That's nicely done. Wow. 
Come down. Can be very tricky with these casters sometimes, especially when you've got a bit of, you know, cricopharyngeal spasm. And so, you know, Vinay is just making sure that he's very um, measured in his approach and has just, you know, what he's done is just go back with the, uh, the catheter and used, you know, just a bit of stiffening on the, um, on the wire just to help delivery of the catheter in to the esophagus and now he'll show you a quick ablation before you go on to the next uh, next center. There we go. So easy does it. There you go. And so Vinay is just going to very gently just squeeze past the catheter into the cervical esophagus. Okay. A bit of spasm. Though, yeah, I know. It's tricky. It. tricky. Okay. Well done. Nicely done, Vinay. So one of the advantages of this device, uh, Sergey, is that you know you 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 have direct visualization. You know, Vinay's in com complete yeah. control here of what he's done with the catheter, and we're going to show you some just a couple of ablations if you don't mind. So Vinay's got his scope just sitting above the catheter. He's really elegantly maneuvered some really tricky anatomy here, and he's got the can, you can see the catheter. So Vinay, over to you. What are you going to do now? So now we're going to work from proximal. Great. So we're going to like how many yeah. how many aerophase sessions do we need for such long segment bird? Uh, a lot. Uh, so, you know, from our data previously, we had a median length of six centimeters. They needed about three to four sessions. Um, in okay. Vinay's hand, he'll probably do this in two sessions, but this guy will probably need about five sessions of therapy. Just expand so the balloon. Just gonna, okay, uh, great. Got a steady position here. Do the first ablation now, so, just sir. Just going to inflate the balloon. And we're going to be using 10 joules in terms of dissymmetry, which will be it's automatically put onto your machine. And once you hear that constant ping there, you're ready show to Show us the balloon, balloon. Uh, Vinay, expanded, please. I'll show you the balloon now. Rihan, you have Very one nice minute. Enough. Yep, no, don't yep. Worry. there we go. So you can see the balloon expanded. It's very tight here, so it slipped down a bit. So we're just going to have to do this blindly slightly. So why don't you ablate there, Vinay? You've got full suction down. Because it's so narrow in the cervical esophagus, sometimes you just have to take a compromise because you know they're going to come back for another session. And before you go, we'll just show you what, uh, what Vinay's done here by just showing you the ablated area. Okay, so guys, thank you so much for this uh, overview about the uh, technologies uh, for bird ablation. Uh, uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, very impressive cases. Thank you so much. Uh, we uh, we should move to thank you everyone for your, uh, your patience. Yes, thank you to the team here. Our travel goes on. Thank you so much. Brian, thank you so much, Rehan. Imagine a world where every single detail is designed to save lives. With our innovation hubs, we are driving innovation for the future. Our intensive research and development employ the insights from clinicians worldwide through our Black Box Innovation Program. Our latest invention, Discovery, is an innovative device using artificial intelligence to support you by directing your attention to unremarkable potential lesions. Our EUS J10 lineup is designed for optimized procedural efficiency during diagnostic endoscopic ultrasound FNA, FNB, and therapy. And there are further unique innovations. For example, under our Pentax medical hygiene commitment, like the DEC duodenoscope, its single patient use Sterile disposable elevator cap helps reduce the risk of cross-contamination. And the Plasma Typhoon and Plasma Bag System, a unique solution for fast drying and active storage of endoscopes. By using this system, confidence in the safety of reprocessing outcomes can be greatly increased. For your therapeutic treatments, Pentax Medical develops state-of-the-art devices such as the multifunctional Splash M-Knife, 
it allows clear marking, effective hemostasis, as well as smoother and easier ESD procedures with a single device. Another example is the K-snare, with an adjustable knife on the tip for precise marking and incision, combined with the snare for resection. Or like the Hemostat Wide Cup, that enables fast and efficient hemostasis through its unique bipolar technology, providing less impact on deeper tissue. These are just some of the many smart innovations that make a difference in your daily work, inspired by the Pentax Medical Triple Aim. This is the world of Pentax Medical. Welcome to the world of intelligence. Well, thanks to the London team for all of that great endoscopy. It's now my honor to escort you to the next two sites for endoscopy because it's really where endoscopy on air uh, was born. Um, so our, our first stop will be in Milan with Alessandro Rapici and his team. And if we don't get an opportunity to say it uh, later, on behalf of the tens of thousands of people who are either watching now or will be watching later, uh, we want to give our great thanks to uh, both Ale Rapici and Thomas Roach for conceiving and executing this amazing event and really helping guide us down through the future of endoscopic education. For our moderation, uh, we will stay in London with George Webster, who's a great friend of the team here in Milan, as well as Endoscopy on Air, and also a veteran of uh, live endoscopy, now virtual. George? Um, Rita, uh, uh, thank you very much. Actually, not in London, but in the uh, in a small cottage in the Lake District, in uh, a beautiful part of uh, Northwest England. Um, it's uh, uh, a huge uh, honour to honour to be part of uh, um, Endoscopy on Air uh, again, and to um, to see what fantastic uh, cases uh, uh, Ali Rapici and. Uh, uh, his superb team in Milan are going to uh, uh, present to us this afternoon. So, uh, uh, Ali, um, you know, as Amrita says, fantastic uh, event uh, again. And, um, you know, great to see what uh, cases you have for us this afternoon. Okay, thanks, George. So, you look very relaxed having some holiday, well deserved uh, vacation. So, congratulations. <laughs> And a great pleasure to welcome everybody again from Milano. The team is here, a lot of people, superstar Roberta Maselli. And you, you know, Roberta is our director of Advanced Therapeutic Program for Resection and Power. I'm so glad she recently got the professorship position in our university at our medical school. So a great achievement, congratulations. I also have a nice present to Amrita because uh, Around the, more than 10,000 people who are watching live right now, 54% are female. So you are leader mm -hmm. for the organization Women in Endoscopy. I recommend everybody to follow Amrita on Women in Endoscopy organization. I think Roberta is on the board as well. So large majority of uh, endoscopists are female right now watching. So before we go to the case, which is very interesting because it's a dysplastic lesion on IBD, I would like to go to another superstar with Cesar Hassan. But I'm male, I'm male, I apologize, Amrita. Uh, I'm male, but... Uh, okay, so before we get started, we want to show this uh, new package that has been prepared by Cantel Medical. So it's a very innovative company. They prepare a package to try to create the best, I would say, condition to prevent infection, uh, to get optimal disinfection in the beginning from uh, colonoscopy, gastroscopy, whatever you have. So we are doing this because we're just using the same material for the case. Mm -hmm. So Cesare, do you want to tell us what you're showing? Yes, Alessandro. Yeah, everything is a single use, uh, consumable. This is a procedural kit that is different between upper and lower endoscopy. When you open this kit, you have inside this pad that is for the patient, sterile. You have the lubricant, you have the soap for the uh, pre-cleaning. You have another pad for the uh, 
a scope, but uh, this is really special, Ale, because this is something that, at least in Italy, we know quite little. This is a single use valve that are extensively used in the UK and in Germany. And you know why? Because the contamination rate of uh, the usable valve is one of the points where it's the reprocessing the is corrupted. So if you do an ERCP immunocompromised patient, an upper lower GI endoscopy, you need to be aware that this is a weakness moment. So Cesare, there has been an Italian study we are particularly proud of about this. Can you tell us yes. what was the study? So this was a, a quasi-randomized uh, prospective study promoted by the two most uh, outstanding Italian scientific society in this field, uh, comparing the contamination rate of reusable with also single use, because you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, exclude that this may also be contaminated. What was the result? That the reusable had a 30% contamination rate, wow. while this had 0%. So this we is a big difference. Yeah. So it's 30 to zero. This is not unexpected, Ale, because other studies uh, previously done uh, show the same. But uh, this study on over 1,000 procedures uh, also uh, assess the satisfaction of the endoscopist. Uh, and I would in, say uh, the nurse is a technician in charge of cleaning, no? Absolutely. So did we replace uh, the single use? Less than mm -hmm. 1% with no difference. Uh, and in addition, there is the trend for a better satisfaction of what is, in my view, Ale, the most important, <laughs> the air water uh, bulb, because you need to uh, insufflate the colon or the uh, upper GI. These are the results of this study, extremely uh, exciting, uh, and uh, the ESGE strongly recommend. Uh, the oh, ES having said that from uh, ESG board yeah. member, so also can you show that at the end what we can do? Yeah, we can adjust, We can keep uh, everything clean, no? Yeah, exactly. We would put the dirty scope here and all the consumables. And uh, it's done like this. Yeah. And so it will, it will bring out of the room. Yes, I will go so now. No contamination at all, no? Absolutely. Everything is consumable and single use. So, Roberta, enjoy your case. <laughs> so now let's go to Roberta. Uh, this is a patient with long-standing... Uh, um, you see ulterior colitis. Also, very glad to have uh, next to me Atmal Kandari from Kuwait. We have a bunch of people who join in Milano. Uh, we love to have uh, guests here. So, you're using Pentascope. This yep. is uh, this plastic lesion on IBD. Can you tell us what is your plan, please? Yeah, my plan is to try to remove this lesion and block uh, for two main reasons. One is because we are in the rectum. The other one is because on IBD. It's a very flat lesion. We can classify this as a 2A, as a 2, uh, 2B as a morphological point of view. If we look at the pattern, it's not really invasive. I'm using the eye scan tree and also the optical enhancement. I'm showing you with the zoom. Oh. To have the announcement of the glandular and vascular pattern, so it's not invasive, it's homogeneous, so it's a granular homogeneous type, it's not very big. And uh, so we need to move forward. Yep. So, how you go to resect it? This so, is the ESD, M block, EMR. What, I'm going what, what? to show you the case snare that is a hybrid snare. Case snare, yeah, the case snare from okay, Pentax. Good. At okay. first, let me just inject, okay, good. Needle out, go. Go, 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 go. So I leave you doing this section. I try to prepare the next case. Okay. okay. Because the lesion is not so big, I will inject just around okay, all the lesion. Adult. Go. Stop. And uh, if you notice, I already marked the lesion because it was very difficult to find. I congratulate with the physician that discovered this lesion because it was so flat and difficult to discover. And because we are on IBD, I did prefer to mark around the lesion. That is something that in the rectum and in the colon we do only on IBD patients that usually we don't need to make the marks because the margins are very clear unless we are in the upper GI, good. Stop. Okay, just a little bit more here. So this near that mm. no, I'm going I'm going to show you in a few seconds. Okay. Is a particular snare from Pentax where you can use the tip of the device, just open it a little bit from the scope to use it as a 
knife. And then when you fully open the device, we have a snare. So we can make an hybrid procedure and an hybrid technique to remove it and block even bigger lesion. Okay, just open the tip. So you can see that the tip is squared. So I will apply, I'm using a value tree electrosurgical generator from Urbe. So outside from my mark, I will simply apply the yellow current, the yellow pedal, that is the endocat cool to make my circumferential incision. Let me check for bleeding. We are in the rectum, so you know that the vessel are more present here. Here we are. So with the blue, It's a small bleeding, but I want to coagulate it. Otherwise, all the plan, it will be dirty and it will be difficult to understand which one is my right plan. Here we are, the vessel is here. So with the same tip, with a different current, I'm trying to coagulate. Otherwise, I will use a dedicated coagulation grasper. We could use the bipolar forceps, but I don't think it's the case. Let me just Try once more. Okay. So let me jet a little bit more. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Roberta, while you're doing that, um, can you comment on the the options for hemostasis during uh, ESD? Uh, whether coagula uh, coagulation yeah, techniques or, or, or other uh, approaches? Yeah, I think that the, the main um, and the crucial point is to understand the anatomy of the vessel, is to detect the vessel at first, is to understand the anatomy and where the vessel is and how big the vessel is, to understand if you are able to manage it with the tip of the device you are using or you need a dedicated co-grasp, as in this case, I clearly see that the vessel is there. So I always clean. So it's crucial to have a water jet scope to be able to clean meanwhile looking for your vessel. And then you can proceed to, with the tip of your device, try to catch exactly the vessel and with the coagulation mode coagulated as in this case. Then usually the Let's say that the rule is that if the vessel is bigger than your device, you should use a different coagulation mode. That means use or a coagrasper or a bipolar forceps. Very nice. So after making the circumferential incision, it's not enough to open the snare and catch it. Otherwise, it's possible that we won't be able to remove the lesion and block. So what I will do is to inject a little bit more to make the trimming. And then later on, I will open the snare and catch the lesion. Let me inject a little bit. Hi, Andrea, we, we are, uh, we're seeing you. Yeah, thanks, George. So let me introduce Andrea, Sian, Ale, Secondale, the entire team, Monica. So, George Webster, he should be very happy to go to ERCP because, George, you, we, we know you're a long ERCP. So we prepared a case of x plus spyglass. So you mm. introduce Andrea, the team. Yes. Thank you, 
you, Alessandro. Thank you, George, Amrita, and all the friends. We are here with a pleasant 70 years old uh, a woman that uh, was referred to us from another hospital after performing an ERCP with uh, the common bile duct stones that was regarded as a difficult biliary stone. Basically, they tried to remove this huge stone uh, without achieving the complete uh, removal. So I understand you using a nice combination of single-use exalt plus spyglass. Yes, you're right, Alessandro. As you know, we call it this procedure as combo. Uh, the combo procedure. And uh, we decide to use this uh, um, procedure for this woman because in the previous ERCP, she had an infection that took her for 14 days more in the hospital. So this is a delicate uh, case and they send that to us also for this. Uh, so Shyam, I mean, this is a good comment. So First, uh, Shyam joined us from the United States after moderation. He has a super private jet. He can fly back and forth uh, everywhere. So Shyam, uh, and they're telling us uh, he's a patient with the previous cholangitis, post-ERCP cholangitis. You think this is one of the conditions that should bring us to the single-use duodenoscope? I think so. I mean, uh, if the patient had an ins had an instrumentation and then developed cholangitis. And if there's no logical explanation for the cholangitis and if the duct was decompressed, could be a possible reason uh, for using a single use uh, scope. And I think the second indication will be the, the, the single operator cholangioscope appears to work very well with exalt because it's uh, the scope stiffness enables easy passage of accessories uh, through the exalt scope. So I think it makes it easy. So we, 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 we did a retrospective collection of cases, uh, around 65 cases uh, for combo procedures, spyglass plus exhaust. We are going to analyze the data, but at the first sight, they look extremely good with a lot of uh, uh, technical and clinical success, very high technical success. Yep. So Andrea, do you want to move forward? Yes, yes, please. Actually, to add something, we realize that also the pushability of the accessory inside of the channel it's nice. very good, probably due to the, to the shape of the scope. And the stiffness we, of the scope. We have well. already removed yeah. the uh, plastic stand, and uh, we are ready now to enter with the spyglass, and we are doing it as a freehand. You can see that the spyglass is a real endoscopic instrument. I can do up, down, right, and left. So I usually try to angle the spyglass towards the papilla like this, I apply the brakes on, and then I go in just like I do with any other um, accessory. Here, you see the papilla, I'm in. So let me switch to the endoscopic view. We are inside the bile duct, and you clearly see that there is the cystic duct here, the lady had a cholecystectomy done with uh, some problem as well. And here is the common bile duct. So I would like to go inside the common bile duct to see if there is still the stone that was described as a big stone. And here it is. As you can see, we are facing directly the stone that is going up into the uh, proximal part of the common by that. Actually, we are going to use the electrohydraulic uh, system for lithotripsy. Electrohydraulic means that we need to have electricity, of course, but also hydraulic, that means water. So while I'm installing water, I can give some shot. And look at this. This is very, very nice because you can work always watching directly what are you doing and you can dig inside the big stone, trying to make a hole and to check. This is very important because when you have the big stones, I always like to do a tunnel, just like my friends from the other room, the luminal friends, they like tunnel. We are doing the same as well. So we are able, hopefully, to break the stones at least in two parts, and this is very important for the removal of the stones. 
I am applying a medium uh, energy with the outlet tower, and I am giving 15 impulse each time I apply the pedal. And as you can see, we have already reached a very nice uh, effect. So I always come back trying to give some shots more. The smaller, the better sometimes. And uh, let's see. You don't want Andrea, to yeah, lovely, lovely demonstration um, uh, of using the, well, the combination of the Axelt single-use Duodenum scope with the spy scope. Can I ask um, yourself and maybe Shyam that the case selection, um, uh, spyglass is not available in every uh, hospital. Um, and certainly we find in London that the vast majority of patients referred to us with difficult stones have, all, have already had at least one, sometimes three, four, five conventional ARCPs. Um, and it was really obvious from the pre-procedure imaging that conventionally RCP was never gonna finish the job. Are there criteria that you feel would, should lead to patients being referred before the initial, but before any sort of conventionally RCP? In other words, straight for spyglass. I think if they have done an MRCP and if the duct stone ratio is greater than one, which means you've got an impact of stone, it's quite obvious that these patients cannot be managed successfully with just sphincroplasty. They will require some sort of an adjuvant treatment. And the higher the ratio, the more likely that mechanical lithotripsy is not going to work. So we really look at the, uh, at the duct and stone ratio and if it is greater than one, I think there's a 90% chance you're going to require some sort of a single operator intervention. I think that is clear cut. Second will be patients with stones over stitches. So it is going to be impossible uh, to remove large stones that is more proximal to your stitcher. So I think these are the two conditions that I would think are absolute indications. What do you think? I totally agree as usual. I would add one more situation that is related to your own experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you may face a stone that is not too difficult in general, but maybe it's too difficult for your condition, your experience, the time, yep. uh, the yep. timing of the stuff. So it's very, very important to, to check for everything. So I think we have a fragment Talone. of a stone and yes. we, are, we are moving with the next Talone. basket, I would think. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, we are going to use a balloon just now because okay. I think we did a great job. Okay. And with the balloon, I will be able also to inject dye and to have a nice anatomical evaluation of the situation. So I may have lose, lost my position just now, but uh, I can go back and forward with my glutinoscope. Andrea, do you do, you do any sort of, um, uh, all these patients will have a sphincterotomy um, prior to insertion of the uh, spy scope, do you, do you often do a, a balloon sphincteroplasty um, uh, uh, even if you know that you're going to do cholangioscopy? This is a very, very nice question that give me the opportunity to tell you that uh, I usually prefer to do a sphincteroplasty because this anyway will help me in uh, reducing the diameter, of course, of the stone during the lithotripsy, but also to enlarge the exit of the stones. So it will be easier for me to perform the uh, stone extraction. Also, if you want to if, do a freehand free hand cannulation with a, yeah. with a spice scope, it makes it easier. Basically, the easier, the better yeah. to, to yeah. me. Contrasto. So now we are nearby the ileum with a balloon completely infl inflated to 15, we are injecting. And in the meantime, we are withdrawing, trying to have a look and to do a cholangiogram. It seems that everything is fine. So I would suggest to check endoscopically 
to see if we are performing a nice extraction. And I don't know, George, if you can see, but there are some fragments coming down just now. And this is very, very important to do this maneuver, George. I call it, you know, the fishing maneuver. Yeah. Like when you are fishing with a tuna fish, Zgonfia, you need to, to leave a little break, break in order to give the last movement. So I think right. that now we can go in again, Gonfia di nuovo, Contrasta. A lot of fragments came down. I think an important teaching point is not to pull the balloon, but just to drag it in the axis of the scope. And then that lets the stones come out. Okay. Actually, this is very important. We can show it radiologically. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shayan, for remembering this. This is a very, very big balloon, probably with a very big stones here. And you can do this maneuver. Right, down. Yeah, that's it. And that's Perfect. it. I think yeah. uh, this is so, one advantage of the, of the uh, single use, particularly this scope, is if you look at the flangiogram or the fluoroscopy okay, image, Tutto. the axis of the scope is fairly perpendicular, which makes yeah. the dragging of the balloon very, very easy. I think that yeah. basically we have finished yeah. and we can uh, give the line to the other room. Thank yeah. you very much. Lovely. It was really nice. a nice thing. Fantastic. Well done. Uh, Roberta and Ale, we're, yep. we're back with you. Okay, good, good. So particularly proud of what Roberta is achieving. So it's about 15 minutes. You got the lesion. So can you show now the yeah. last part? Yeah, I will open fully the device and you will see that it's a snare. It's a 22 millimeter snare. So I will catch the lesion that I completely and almost removed by standard DSD with the same device. You can start closing, close, 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 stop. And then just apply the current. Okay. Okay, great job. Congratulations to the team. Very nice. This is the yeah, uh, result that we want to achieve with the IBD lesion. Ale, but because oh, of the vascularity, yeah, yeah, let me... Let me just apply something to cover as okay. a gel. That's up to you. Yeah, I want to what, apply what the, the poorer stuff. Let okay. me check this Let's... vessel is a small okay. sporting vessel. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Give me the poorer stuff. Thank you. So, Roberto, you if, know that the if poor... we have can you, time can you make a comment ask... on what you're doing? Sorry, sorry, if George. Have... Yeah, just if we've, if we've got time, it, it, I mean, outstanding, you know, uh, clean results. I mean, absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, does EMR have a role in this case, or would one always say, you know, in 2021, in the setting of IBD, that flat lesion should be resected with ESD, or, or you know, can one uh, defend the position of uh, doing an EMR in this case? So in 2021, this type of lesion for two main reasons, because of IBD and because we are in the reaction, should be removed and blocked. And block doesn't mean ESD or EMR, but mean and block. Sorry, I want to remove it because it's tiny and otherwise uh, I need to collapse all the column or the lumen because you know that to apply pura stat, we need to exactly. use the gravity yeah. and we are opposite to the gravity. So in this case, the pura task will go on the other side. So I want the lumen to be collapsed. Otherwise the, the gel won't stay there in the target place that I want. So in 2021, again, we should remove this type of lesion and block. So the matter is the size and the skillness of the operator if you are able to perform ESD as in this case or EMR. The other fact is that nowadays we have some devices one as minute. this one that helps you in having and achieving okay. an end block and to make the minute. hybrid technique Archimedes. to have a very high rate of end block resection using, using something that is uh, typically hybrid. Okay. Let's Look at this small food investor. Go. I'm not inflating a lot of CO2 because uh, otherwise, as I said, you for the gravity, the pura stat will go on the other side. And the pura stat is this uh, peptide that is transparent. So usually, also during the procedure, you can apply it, stay, stop. 
just wait that it will help me for that uh, small uh, yeah the small uh, bleeding point not cleaning not washing not inflating or deflating on that side too much otherwise you will remove the gel that you are applying also here go it's transparent i can stop and check stop look in few seconds i try to stay stable but it's not very easy because of the gravity go and, and, and can way, i ask would we'll you consider all. would you consider pure stat um in all uh, ESDs or, or only in those where there is some concern about uh, uh, ongoing bleeding? Yeah, in this case, we are using uh, in two manner. I mean, uh, just to help us uh, in uh, achieving the hemostasis of those small vessels that were tiny bleeding, but also in a prophylactic way, just to prevent delayed bleeding. So it depends on your, I mean, the, the aim of what are you doing. Usually for prevention, it's very good to apply the gel that is uh, transparent, easy to use, uh, easy to be used uh, and ready to be used because you have in the fridge is a simple catheter. You don't need uh, a very, you know, stepwise approach to understand how to use it, how to apply it. It's very, very simple. My assistant is just pushing the syringe and uh, all the content is here. So in few seconds you've done and your bed is covered, let's say, and it's done. Have to use it in IVD because even without a fortunate study, it could enhance the wound healing as well as prevent delayed bleeding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asthma is completely right. You know that with poor start, we uh, in one way we prevent the bleeding and we can achieve the uh, the most stages of the bleeding point. But it also helps you in uh, have a nice healing on the scars. And because on IBD we have this type of inflammation and then healing, inflammation and then healing. And later on with DSD, it's again a type of ulcer that we are provocating on the uh, wall. So it's helped you in the healing process. So it's very true. Fantastic demonstration. Maybe you have to really use the bad. mic, Asma. Okay. So we are back again. And no. uh, this you is the to... last step of the procedure. We are and in... since the patient has got prior history of infection, has traveled a long distance, and a biodegradable Archimedes stent is being placed. So this is a 10 French, eight centimeter stent. Yeah. As you can see, we have a pre-activated heat with water and we are just pushing the stent just the way. Nobody is for pushing. We, at the moment, I'm using uh, the previous balloon as a pusher. We but can use, a no, awesome. no, this is the, another very interesting situation. Definitely, Alessandro, this is the chain. And I think it's pretty clear Huh. The system. The system was invented by Archimedes in the third century before Christ. And it can drain either from the inside. Look at this. I'm removing the, the wire. So either from the inside or from the outside because of the helicoidal shape. We choose the long lasting stent that is uh, three a month in order to ensure a proper uh, drainage. And how long will the stent be visible on X-ray? At the least, the study, so he yes. In more than 90% of the cases, you will see the stent for three months. Then he will start the biodegradation. But because he do the drainage also from the outside, he is working always for this uh, condition. So we are very happy. And Congratulations, we don't guys. We are perfect, you. perfectly in time. And we need to move to... Bandari's room, so I think it's uh, room four. Great job, guys. Great job with the anesthesiologist, please. Thank Let me you. Show the anesthesiologist. We cannot do anything without her. Okay. Absolutely. Definitely. And thanks. Uh, great case, Andrea. Beautifully done. Thank you. See you later. Pradeep. Hello. What are you What are you doing over in Italy? Good to uh, um, Good, good to uh, see you. Thank you very much. That's about uh, your case. Not, haven't left England for a long time, so it's a real pleasure <laughs> to be here in Italy. Uh, I'm in suite four with uh, Alicia, one of the rising stars and rest of Professor Apigi's team. Uh, we have a rectal polyp, and lots of people promote rectal 
rectum is the best area to learn ESD. And if Thomas Roche is listening, he'll agree with me that it is a nightmare situation in rectum with the venous plexuses, vessels, and bleeding. I so uh, what we want to do is show you uh, a novel knife uh, and a novel technique of doing ESD. Uh, so first I want to show you, I'm using a Fujifilm EG760 CT gastroscope because in rectum gastroscope allows more flexibility. This has a 3.8 millimeter channel, so allows a lot of suction so we can save time. I'm using a Fuji hood which allows me to get under okay. these lesions very well. Okay. And yes, I'll be using a new problem. knife from Medtronic called switch knife. Okay. So if we show okay. the needle okay. type knife okay. first, please, needle type. So you see, it's like a needle type knife, very much like flush knife and dual knife. But then when I'm doing blind dissection, I want protection against the muscle. So we want the IT type, the ball type knife now. And it switches over to a new knife. So I've got two in one, uh, George. We love mm. deals, so this is the best deal. You get two in one knives here and I can switch between either of them as I want. So I've already done a bit of uh, work in the front and had a lot of bleeding which we have controlled. And now what I want to do is a circumferential mucosal incision. Uh, and then uh, uh, once I've done the circumferential incision, we'll deploy some traction device and you can come back and see how we do that. So here, I'll show you the two functions of the knife quickly. So if you show the needle type knife, needle type now, please. Excellent. Get the needle type, now the other one. So it requires a lot of training with the nurses to be very sure. And, and uh, pretty, are you needing to change the electrocautery settings depending on which, uh, which of the knives you're using? The knives, generally, most of them work at the same setting, but we have a very modern uh, RB generator here, uh, which gives you all the clever settings of swift coagulation, soft coagulation, and I have control in my foot pedal with a black toggle, which allows me to shift uh, but if I have a bleed, I press this toggle, you see, uh, it changes to soft coagulation. As I move back to dissection, I press the toggle and it will move back to my uh, setting for dissection. There we go, back to. So you can set up a lot of settings. Here is the needle type knife, George. So what I'll do is show you uh, in retroflexion, we can use needle type knife very well, but the knife is perpendicular to the muscle and that increases the risk of perforation. It does the job, but the risk is high. So you could, if you are an early starter in ESD, uh, give me the ball type knife knife, please. Uh, you can make ESD safer and you can change over to this version uh, where you see now the ceramic ball protects me against uh, injuring the muscle. But it just requires uh, hang on a second, a, a good control hang on, uh, in terms of direction. So if we know where we're going, you hook this knife underneath uh, with the ceramic ball pointing to the muscle, and that reduces the risk of damage to the muscle. But it does require traction. Uh, you see here, so I hook it in. You see that? So, yeah. In the meantime, you complete about We talk about a lot about training and, you know, endoscopists, uh, you know, how they get their training in ESD. But you do want to comment about the, the, the team overall. You know, we, these new knives, they have dual modalities. You, you know, you're absolutely dependent upon skilled. Um, yeah. you know, endoscopy uh, assistants and nurses. Did you want to make any comment about how well, we should be? Well, uh, uh, this is a teamwork, This is a complete teamwork. So my team knows when I need soft coagulation, swift coagulation, they're changing the diathermy setting without me saying. So it does require training the entire team, uh, endoscopists, nurses, and the assistant, as well as your pathologist. Don't forget, 
if they don't give the right report, it's all waste of time doing all this. Sorry, Dr. Rapici had a question. Ali, you want to move on? I think that if we can move to a better assigned room. Yeah. And we will uh, come back quickly to you to show the touch of the light. And okay. Good. I never use it, so it's very good. Okay. So please move to a better assigned room. Very nice, Pradeep. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's have a look. Yeah. Scott. Ah, scusa. Should we just put. We're still with you for now, uh, Pradeep. Yeah. So we're still watching. Can I give some info calls? Uh, oh, who's in there? Okay. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks, Ali, for uh, this invitation. We are here with uh, this uh, screening procedure with uh, uh, a very dedicated uh, scope. You may recognize uh, what nice. it looks like an Eluxeo 760, yeah. but uh, this scope. Uh, as the GI balloon, can you please uh, uh, hear that uh, is helpful to flatten the fold. You know that to flatten the fold is one of the most important criteria for mucosa inspection. This balloon can be handled very uh, simple with a controller and uh, you have uh, either a handable controller or you have uh, a pump. You can insufflate in uh, three position and uh, usually we use the intermediate and uh, now I just push here the pedal and uh, the uh, light is uh, lumping and this means that the uh, balloon is uh, uh, inflating. In addition, uh, uh, in doing this uh, endoscopy, I'm not uh, alone, despite uh, there is uh, no one around me, but can you please uh, focus on uh, GI Genius, uh, that is uh, the artificial intelligence uh, uh, distributed by uh, Medtronic uh, and validated here in Humanitas by uh, Alessandro that uh, help in detecting uh, the lesion. So when I scope, uh, I'm not uh, alone. My attention is mainly on navigation to expose the mucosa. And I learned in these years uh, to interact with my AI machine in order to differentiate what is a false positive like this that you see now and a true positive that is uh, the lesion. Now I have the balloon and I can uh, feel a, a bit resistant uh, when I uh, withdraw, but this is exactly the purpose uh, of uh, this. As you may see, I can expose uh, behind uh, the fold. Here is where uh, you have the miss rate uh, of lesion that you need to uh, avoid. And I feel that this balloon uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, addition uh, to a standard colonoscopy. I'm going now in a spiral way looking behind uh, each fold. Of course, it's not always easy. And there are some corners like this where it is easy. This is a false positive, but I don't uh, waste any time. I can wash uh, and I exclude. So it's just a fraction of a second. We show Ale that this false positive don't make you waste more than um, a 20 or, or 30 seconds per um, a colonoscopy. And we continue to scope uh, very, very slowly and now we have an activation and we relook here and uh, this uh, was uh, a signal and flagged by the uh, machine and uh, I can now re-evaluate. See how difficult it is to detect an adenoma even when you know that uh, uh, it's there. And then uh, you see, Ale, how uh, oh, the is, is uh, consistent with any advanced imaging. It works with uh, a blue light. Okay, please, Ale. So oh, I think this is a um, great demonstration and because it's showing the, exactly the location, right colon, tiny lesion, adenomatous. So where you may miss lesion and where the machine gives a lot of strength to your performance. I am particularly proud of this technology, GI Genius, because it's been developed by an Italian team, Cosmo, that I want to personally thank at any level from the leadership to all technicians. They have worked very hard to develop this uh, very important innovation for saving life of our patients. 
GI Genius is making an impact as all AI system. Everything we are going to adopt as intelligence, artificial intelligence in colonoscopy is going to prevent much more colorectal cancer because we are seeing what we normally miss. So I do believe that in the future, the miss rate of cancer and the miss rate of adenomatous with this GI genius device will significantly drop down. So Cesare. Yes, Ale, we saw a second lead. Now you may see this patient has a lot of spasm, but we cannot use a buscopan because he has uh, ocular hypertension. But this That's is a, a third, uh, eh? yeah, this is a third lead that we anyway uh, found. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, thanks both to the balloon, I would say, and uh, uh, to uh, GI genius. Here is the, the lead. So, uh, congratulations um, just, just for showing uh, the system. Do we want to briefly summarize uh, the results of the study that we published recently in gastroenterology? Yes, we have about 30 uh, seconds before moving to room nine, uh, uh, number yes, four. Yes, uh, Alessandro, when you use GI genius, uh, you can expect uh, a 30% increase in uh, uh, ADR and a 46% increase in APC. And what is important is that this is irrespective of your um, uh, level of uh, experience. So uh, wherever you are, uh, you can uh, improve your uh, uh, detection. And uh, I guess that uh, with the GI balloon, uh, tiny yeah, the, there, no, right? yeah, yeah, I feel this is uh, more than tiny lead. No, here you ah, see okay. Ale. A ah, okay. large uh, lead on. We are going to lose this. Absolutely. And uh, it was signaled as two, three small lead on, but this doesn't change the fact. Now you can see it's a big lead on. Okay. So even, yeah, whenever Good. you see a Thanks, green Cesare. square, you need to be Just careful. Just move for the next uh, three minutes to Pradeep Bandari, and afterwards we need to leave Milano and go to the next city, which will be Hamburg with Thomas Roche. Okay, Pradeep. Luke. Yeah, hello. We're you back? back with you. Oh, okay. Uh, I just, uh, what I've done, George, is using a new traction wire. Um, this is a latest innovation in the world of ESD. And I honestly believe this type of innovation uh, will make everybody, well, not everybody, even a person like uh, Dr. George Webster, who only does ERCPs, can start <laughs> doing ESD. Uh, because biggest challenge in ESD is we don't have traction. We can't see our planes. So what I have here is a Prodigy traction wire from Medtronic. You see a clip there. The clip, the one arm of the clip has this metal wire attached to it. So I've just done, created a little flap, attached this clip along with the traction wire. And now I'll use a second, uh, second clip and pin this traction wire to the opposite wall, George. And that will pull it open. This will be like how surgeons have their assistant holding those retractors and opening the planes for surgeons to drive their knife. Uh, that's more or less the same thing now for the endoscopist. Open, please. So if you can, so this is a second clip if you rotate it like that. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, okay, just just close gently, close. Close, yeah, okay. So look, I, I got the traction wire, George. Now the challenge is finding the right place to deploy this so that we get enough traction, but not too much, uh, and also in the right direction. So generally, you put it on the anal side uh, and clip the wire to the sequel side so it should open the plane. So if you could hold the scope for me there, please. I think I can feel the traction there. So if I clip it there, open please. And close. Okay, and fire. Yeah. Okay. So now you see, George, uh, this has opened up the submucosal plane. Uh, so if yeah. I get the knife, please. Knife. And uh, will dissect in this plane. As I dissect more, we get more and more traction. And hopefully the more and more planes will open up. Uh, but the planes here are slightly muddied because of uh, all the bleeding. As I said in rectum, our biggest enemy is bleeding. Uh, 
and we encountered hell a lot of vessels, which is not uncommon in these low rectal polyps. Okay, knife out, please. Just the needle type. So this is that knife which converts into needle type or the ball type uh, by just switch of settings. So if you hold the scope for me just for a second. Uh, and now endoscopist has to use this plane and dissect, stay parallel to the muscle. Okay, and we come back. You see, George, it's opening up. You agree? Yeah, very nice. Yeah. So, and, uh, and no can, risk can of too much early? Okay, so this is masterfully demonstrated. So that was a thrilling pressure. I can think of that traction device that will have an impact in a future years. A huge. So us to have more control. So probably in the future we'll use more and more Kind of Absolutely. Now it's time we have, we have about 20 minutes of delay and we need to go. To ah. The My great, great pleasure to introduce Thomas Roche, age six. So, Andrea, back to you now. Okay, bye, guys. Very good. Nice case, Pradeep. Very good. Yeah. Look at the best part, and Ali said goodbye. <laughs> and you're still. Missing. Stud is a new agent on the market for bleeding control. But it's not only for bleeding control, most important for us, we have seen it's transparent, its suitability is fantastic, yeah, and also it's a synthetic agent, and most important for us, I think, it's extremely easy to use. Puristat is a very exciting tool that we have available. I think it has huge potential. It is a very safe and effective treatment, usually extremely well tolerated, can be very simply and accurately placed in the, in the position you want it to, to be acting, and certainly it is very effective in terms of providing uh, rapid hemostasis. Application takes often no more than five minutes, so it's massively exciting. We use Purestat prophylactically to reduce the risk of delayed bleed. I feel it's quite safe and effective agent to use, both for EMR and ESD. Catheter does not get blocked. A very quick and easy, very simple training that you need to know about it. You can see through it and you can apply any other form of treatment. Heat, clips, injection, anything you want to do. Endoscopic resection uh, in the gut is associated with the risk of intraprocedural bleed and delayed bleed. So intraprocedural bleed, most of the time a doctor performing endoscopic resection should be capable enough to control and treat. However, delayed bleed remains a big challenge for all of us in the endoscopy community. We started using Purestat for all the intraprocedural bleed and then we were using Purostat to reduce the risk of delayed bleed after resection. We can identify patients who are at high risk of delayed bleed as compared to those who are not at high risk. So we know that patients with duodenal EMR are at very high risk of delayed bleed. We know that elderly patients or those with right-sided uh, large colonic lesions, those patients who take aspirin and clopidogrel or have multiple comorbidities that are high risk of delayed bleed. Uh -oh. 
Hi, everyone. So we'll take a short break from Milan and now head up to Hamburg Command Central for Endoscopy on Air, where we'll join Thomas Roche and his team. I've had the great pr privilege of traveling around the world with Thomas to have some great conversations. And now it's a pleasure to actually visit his site and also um, congratulate him on and the Endoscopy on Air team there. It's a, it's a massive production that's happening behind the scenes. Um, and our moderator uh, for this session will be Jack Bergman from uh, the Academic Medical Center AMC in Amsterdam. Uh, Jack, great to see you. Um, looking forward to this great session. Looking forward to moderating that. I feel honored being part of this. And so I'm, I'm very happy to moderate this session from Amsterdam. I see that Thomas is already uh, moving back and forth and wanting to go on air. Thomas, good afternoon. How are you doing? Hi, hi, Jack. Good to see you. Uh, yes, um, I try to uh, to stay fit and moving back and forth. ESD is a long procedure. But anyway, so welcome everybody. We have a variety of procedures, Shaq, uh, where you can make uh, quite a few comments. We start with a simple one. We have three Barrett cases lined up and probably seemingly the simplest procedure is ablation. And we'll be showing you hybrid APC and going to another room where Philip Doutel has a case for you. Philip, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Um, our patient, can we have the endoscopic image? with an ESD in 2016 because of a low risk adenocarcinoma, Barrett's esophagus carcinoma. And um, in the time after that, he had different, uh, more ablation therapy of the residual Barrett's esophagus. He had RFA in two times and APC as well. And in the last um, surveillance gastroscopy, there, was, there were three small pieces of suspicious residual Barrett's esophagus described. And we want to have a look here. As you can see, we have a transparent hood to keep some distance to the mucosa and to have a more stable position to get a clear and close look to the surface. To enhance the vascular pattern, we can use NBI. As you can see on the top right, I have the near focus used as well. So this is one of the small areas were described. And as you can, as you all know, it's not always very easy to um, decide whether this is just gastric mucosa or really Barrett's esophagus. This is the one area we have to think about. And then uh, this is the second small area right here. Because of the ESD, he has a uh, slight scarring on the right-hand side. And uh, to get a proper position on the end of the scar is not so easy, as you can see. But there, um, we have this small island. And um, we uh, took biopsies within the last gastroscopy, which showed that um, on the 3 o'clock position on the right side, um, that over there, there is residual Barrett's esophagus. So this is the area we are going to treat today. As you can see, it's not, not really a large area. And um, we are using hybrid APC, as Thomas mentioned before. So um, therefore, we have the ABA hybrid APC probe, which is right here, as you can see. Um, I take off the NBI mode and the zoom mode as well. Um, well, the zoom is still in. Yeah, now it's OK. Um, so. Um, the hybrid APC probe um, combines the injection using a high pressure pump as well as uh, the APC probe. As you can see here, if I use the foot panel, I can get the thin high pressure injection, which passes the mucosa and then uh, provides a submucosal cushion so we can treat the Barrett's epithelium uh, with a little bit more APC. Uh, with more effect on the APC. Now we have to get a good position again, and we will start injecting here. I use the foot panel again, and hopefully you can see the lifting sign. Yeah, quite close because of the scar, I have to go in this position, so it's not that nicely to see. 
going back and yeah okay maybe you can see like this better but as you can see a small cushion is already there okay so this is the one area we're gonna treat first and then our apc probe is um there already and we're going to use the pulsed apc with an effect of six and we start here we're trying not to touch the mucosa which is not so easy in this position so i'm going a little bit back with the probe and then we can see the apc working a little more distance there you can see the effect on the right side of this area is not good enough so you're gonna do a little more over there and after the first round of ablation we're going to do a second round in between we have to scrap off the treated mucosa and on the end of the scar as you can see it's more getting a fold so i have to try to reach into that fold trying to get a little better position. I think there's it's not enough coagulation there at the moment. If I'm pulling back, it tends to give a plop and then I'm out again. Okay, right here, a little up. So Philip, can you hear me? This is Shark speaking. Okay, perfect. I think for this Apparently piece, he cannot hear me. First round, oh, there you can so see how we scrap off the mucosa, the damaged mucosa, and this is the area we are, we are going to treat with a second round of ablation again. Grab once more, okay, and then some. Okay, now we have to change the settings on the Alba VO3 from pulsed APC and the effect of six. Maybe you can see the. Vio3 as well. Okay, yeah, you can't see. Yeah, there you see. Okay, so this is the pulsed APC with the effect of four. And we are doing a second round of ablation in this area with a lower effect. And before that, we are doing another injection to lift up this again and get the submucosal cushion, which um, provides some protection for the muscle layer so that the damage and the heat effect is not going to deep. They, they, now you've seen the um, lifting sign a little better, still quite close to the mucosa, so it's hard to see. And now we Philip, have the can second you, round. Philip, can you hear me? Hello? Can't you hear louder, man? I can't, I can't hear you. Wait a second. I'm putting up the sound. Yeah, now maybe I can hear you. Philip, um, can I make a couple of... Uh, and while you may... Uh, continue uh, using the APC. I think it's very important that you use the cap uh, because yeah. it allows you to get in between the fold and to stabilize yourself. Contact technique and so not being in contact is easier with the cap. So that's uh, that's a, a crucial thing. Um, True. The second thing is you have to be careful that by cleaning you will slough off also the squamous mucosa and a sloughed off area of ablated squamous mucosa just looks like a Barrett's tongue. So you run the risk that you that you keep on ablating and every time that you clean that, that it still looks like a Barrett's, but it's not Barrett's, it's squamous. So that's a, a pitfall for less experienced endoscopists using this. Yeah. Um, the Barrett's is not very extensive. Do we really need the lifting or could you just have ablated without doing the submucosal lift? So I didn't get the last point. It's not missing louder, man. No. Could you have done this APC ablation of these two small tongs without doing any submucosal lifting? Yeah, well, you could as well do, but um, if you do the submucosal injection, you can use a little more effect with lower risk of thermal damage in the deeper layers and especially to the muscle layer. So that's why we use the injection. We not always use the um, hybrid APC, therefore, you can also use a needle to inject and then use a normal APC probe. This is also possible. Especially in small areas like this. So, okay, I think, um, as you said before, 
um, the area seems to be seems to get bigger every time you do an ablation, and um, so I think now that's good enough for the second round. And I'm finished with this part, and I'm going to give to Thomas again to the ESD. Thank you. Excellent demonstration, Thomas. We're back with you. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to two um, resection cases in parallel together with. Um, uh, Helmut Messmann, and I show you the there are two very very interesting cases diagnostic wise. The first one, that's Helmut's case, had a resection procedure something like nine years. No, 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 back. Uh, something like back slide back, please. Something like uh, nine years ago, and then uh, didn't follow up for residual Barrett ablation, which he shouldn't have done, and uh, comes back to his referring physician with an ulcer and then gets uh, biopsied and it's high grade and then gets he gets PPI. And what you see is that the ulcer has gone and this looks like a squamous island. It's very tricky, next slide. And only if you know actually, you see that on the left side there's inhomogeneous tissue and uh, uh, a structural tissue. The rest of the Barrett looks completely normal and if we compared it uh, with the uh, previous pictures, this must be the place. Case number two, which is my case, next slide, is uh, simpler, but a little bit hidden in a hernia. It looks like a cardiac cancer, but histology says it's Barrett. If you look at the left side, if you are in a quick mood, you might miss it and say, oh, there's some uh, inflammatory tissue. And if you take a closer look, it looks more suspicious. And then if you know the histology as a referral center, next one, of course, you can imaging, image it in a way that you see it's clearly abnormal, also a structural. So um, let's go back to endoscopy. We are at different stages, Helmut and myself. So maybe we can add Helmut to the picture. And I have already started here. <laughs> Hi, Helmut. Hi, Thomas. So thank you uh, oh, for, us, for, you? for invitation to Hamburg. I'm always happy to be here with a wonderful team. Uh, Dr. Sonnenberg, she's the anesthesiologist, Dr. De Heer, and, and, and the best guy is definitely Nils. I would like to have him in Augsburg, but he obviously is too expensive for me. So he will definitely stay in Hamburg, he told me. Now, um, <laughs> uh, just kidding. Helmut. So this is a, a, a very interesting case, Thomas. Thank you for this case. This is a patient with a long segment Barrett, and as you said, it looks quite normal. There are some small islands which uh, are absolute uh, regular. I'm going back, there's a larger island here, and then here is the end of the Barrett. And as you showed in your image before, this island was obviously suspicious. There was an ulceration and it healed under PPI. And um, meanwhile, it obviously is more covered, but there is obviously a cancer below this island. And this the only thing which is suspicious for me is, oops. No? Let's get this end behind it. The end near focus does not work. I would like to use near focus, but there is a problem right now. I don't know why. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it worked. Uh, this is a shame uh, that we cannot see use now. Helmut? The near focus system. Um, Helmut? Yeah, please. I think um, in the meantime, while you're looking for better imaging, let's have a short look at uh, our lesion that's more clear, I think. And uh, yeah, we are it scoping, it's really we have Olympus, we have Pentax. So we are scoping with the latest generation Pentax scope, which image Sorry magnification and also the different it's eye uh, scan functions. And that's pretty clear to show that this is a lesion. And what we want to do uh, before I give back to you is to show you that we have circumcised. You can also see it in a very nice uh, retroversion function yeah, yeah. of the scope. 
And we want to show you a special injection solution before I hand over to you, lift up from Ovesco, which we have already used, but we'll use further. Klaus. Sandra, who helps me, will inject. It comes cold and it hardens. Stop. And then it stays there for quite a while. It makes your life easier. Okay. Good. Okay, okay, okay. Nice. So, okay, nice. So this is what we wanted to show. We make a hemostasis of this. If you have, if you hit the vessel, then you press here against. Here you see the nice uh, blood flow, and I do hemostasis okay. and Helmut. Um, Let's get you within it. Thomas, do you always need to have the needle out if you're already in the submucosal space, or Not can you also inject good without point, without the needle? You're right. Very good point. Most bleeding comes from from the needle out. Can you show that that you can inject with uh, on the that? Oh, sorry, that's not the injection needle. No. That's right. the uh, ablation tool. This is so. And also, you are in different levels when you do that. You know. Yeah. So on the right side, there's submucosa. When you see that, you know that the left side is not deep enough. So we will go on with a special current from Erbe. They programmed for me. It's called twin coag and has a very nice coagulation function. So I get into the layer where I want. So Thomas, what type of knife is this? That's a dual knife. Okay, but the knife is closed then. Your, your, the knife is your... closed, okay. which I prefer. Of course, when I'm deep in the submucosa, I can also exit the knife, but I want to get into the right layer first. And that's usually underneath the vessels. So I will go on. So Thomas, can you just yeah, show the audience? Can you just show the audience how the knife looks when it's out, so that they understand yes, what the difference out. is? Uh -huh. Here, I can yeah, work so, with this as well. But it's a this is a one point five millimeter dual knife. Yes. But but if yes. if you're in a tricky area. You can actually close the knife and only use the closed knife to be very delicate, okay. like you're dem like you were demonstrating. Yes, exactly. It takes a bit longer, but it's uh, as you can see here. And this, if you see this only, you may say, "Okay, that's submucosa," but it's clearly not far enough if you compare it to the right side. Let's check what Helmut is doing. Helmut, how far are you? Yeah, Thomas. Sorry, we have some technical problems. Uh, with the scope, so uh, uh, the uh, the system tells us ask Olympus. Okay. <laughs> well, we have now to switch the endoscope. There is a technical problem. Sorry for this. Um, so can go on. during a live, as you all know. But uh, your team is fantastic, and now I have a new scope immediately, and I hope to show you this lesion. Well, as you saw, um, I think. Um, um, right. Shakti is also uh, online. This is a, a lesion. It's not very huge. It's maybe one centimeter. And below this, uh, below this squamous epithelium, there there seems to be the cancer. So the the surface is a bit so, a bit of nodules visible, and also the vascularity seems uh, suspicious and it's a bit depressed. So I think it's. Although it's very small, um, I think it's a good indication for ESD. Um, in, in our series, we have meanwhile more than um, 600 ESD procedures. Um, we we uh, used, we have about 10% of Barrett cancer who had been pretreated, and the R0 resection rate from the naive Barrett's is about 80%, and from the uh, pretreated 70. So. It's still possible. It's a bit lower uh, now, I hope. But I think it's more or less a problem with the processor and not with the scope. So it's, yeah, <laughs> still, still problem. Still the same problem. We don't have any image. It, it appeared we had, we had time <laughs> enough, but it appeared immediately before we go online. So the processor is not working. Sorry? 
That's my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you can switch now to Thomas Resch, please, um, until we have solved this uh, technical problem. Thomas, we're back yeah. with you. You've changed. You've changed the knife. Okay. Yes, uh, we wanted to show you. Of course, you can work this little bit around with different knives. That's the knife from Urbe, where you can also do injection. As you can see here, it's blowing up. So we have shown you several ways of injection. The lift up is still there, but you can add a bisschen raus. You can add uh, some other fluid with the other knives. And here's a vessel again. So this is what we are going to do. We dissecting this around. This is also not deep enough. Now inject again. So just for the, the for the for the audience at home, just to clarify. So the, the lesion here is basically at the 12, 12 o'clock position and it's hanging down due to gravity. So that's why right. Right. Thomas has the, the lesion actually pulling onto the submucosa and that allows you to, to approach the lesion even at the, at the 12 o'clock position. So gravity is helping during this dissection. And this is the anal side of the incision. Yes. So and I can show I'm almost around. Here's the lesion. I dissected the lesion around here. And then we will go on. Although for time reasons, I think um, when Helmut is in place again, we then will show you a poem. So you see here, you can with different knives, if you are used to them, have a very controlled resection. So Thomas, is there any basic rules if it comes to uh, the incision? You say I've, I've circumcised the lesion. What's the what's the most common mistake that that people make if they circumcise the lesion? Well, there are different Maybe. strategies. You know, if you talk to Japanese, they uh, have uh, several different strategies how to access these lesions. Uh, so usually, I finish the circumcision which um, I will do probably when we have left you. And then I, in larger lesions, I do a tunnel. So I go through here and then I leave the sides on both sides for the tunnel. Oh, quite often I place a clip and pull on the clip. Yeah. So here you can see the entire area from above. And what we will do is continue working here. But I think um, the plan was oh. to go back to Helmut and then continue with poem. So um, not sure whether that's possible. Obviously, they're exchanging the scope. Sorry for that. Well, maybe I can make a couple of comments just to, to keep yeah. talking while we wait well, until we move. And so well, feel free to switch I'll, rooms. So one of the, one of the key things is, over here. is if you if you make your mucosal incision, uh -huh. uh, one of the you need to make sure that it's deep uh -huh. enough because if the mucosal incision at the anal side if it's not deep enough you will keep continue your submucosal dissection underneath Absolutely. your previous incision. So it's not only doing the incision but you need to extend the incision until you're really at the submucosal plane. Um, and then, yeah, Jacques, do you think that's deep enough here? Maybe not yet, huh? So we inject? No, not yet. And you can do this like you're doing now, like in the anterograde fashion. That means that you're, you will be dissecting into the anal side, basically towards the stomach. Mm -hmm. The lesion is at 12 o'clock, or you can do it in a retroflex position and that will get you underneath the lesion, but it's so sometimes we, it's more difficult. Before we go to Helmut, we show you both. So now comes the injection with needle in. Spritzen, needle dran. It also works well, see, stop, yeah. Okay, and then you clearly see it's not far enough. Stop, and now this dual knife again. 
And then I show you what Chuck meant with retroversion. That's also a nice way to hook yourself in, like here. See that? If you have a scope which retroflexes nicely. So here we will go on. And then continue. Here you see the lesion in, in inversion. Yeah, so ideally you'd like to do as much as you can in inversion, but the lesions like this are pretty strenuous on your endoscopes if it comes to the angle the endoscope can make. And not all, not all endoscopes really give you optimal retroversion. Even within your department, endoscopes of the same okay. type. Some, one, so this is something you need to check before you start your procedure. Do I have an, an do I have one of my best okay. retroflexing gastroscopes for a case mm -hmm. like this? Absolutely, that's a, that's a big problem. And there is some wear and tear with endoscopes. So now you can see that, so, so since you're wedged with your cap, this is a very stable position. The lesion is at 12 and your cap is stabilizing the position. So that's a beautiful, just very elegant way of Rose? cutting in the same in the same plane. Absolutely. Chuck, we are a little and, bit and Thomas, running you're doing all of this. I don't know. You're, you're doing all of this with a closed knife. Eh? So that's I think yes. it's important for the audience to, to realize. So Thomas is go, is moving quickly, but his knife is in. So uh, therefore he, he runs very little danger actually in damaging the deeper muscle layers. If you would do this with a knife out, then logically the movements would have to be much more subtle and much more elegant. Uh, but here you can just make quick steps. Rose. Chuck, since time is running, I don't know what Helmut is up for in the next room, right? I think we probably move to the accolation case. And uh, I get out. Or we could move to another room where Alex is doing a colonoscopy. This in, ah, it also takes a little bit. So you have to live with me, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, we can do that. No problem. Helmut, Helmut is inspecting the ceiling with the endoscope, so we're not ready there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bear with us, Helmut, it will work. Yeah. Ja, wir wollen schon lang <lacht> an uns. Da könnten loslegen. Okay, here we are. <clears throat> yeah, can you see the image right now? Not yet, or you yes, don't? we can. Yeah, no, once again, this is now our, our small island. It's a bit depressed and now going to the near focus and uh, to the zoom, uh, to NBI and maybe a, a bit underwater then you can nicely see there is a scar. He was obviously taking the biopsy and there is the cancer of this is this nodule. And, and in the previous image from Thomas, here was this suspicious area. So I think the cancer is growing below this island and it must be fibrotic. So 
I think from my point of view, it is a nice indication for an ESD procedure. What do you mean, Chuck? You you are the world champion in uh, EMR cap. <laughs> so would you would you use a cap EMR or would you go for an ESD as well here? Well, I think I would at least I would I would set up the I would set up the resection as an ESD, anticipating that that this yeah. is Look probably here. scarred. It's, yeah, it looks yeah. scarred, and this is. Uh, I think, yeah, very fibrotic. So although it's it's small, and now uh, I use acetic acid uh, to see what whether where are the borders, but I, I don't ex 